Hello, good afternoon. You're very welcome. I'm really happy to be uh, stepping in here today to moderate this discussion. I've been looking forward to it for some time. And um, I think we've all, this pandemic has really shown us just how interlinked our lives and our welfare are. Uh, there's no such thing as individual welfare anymore. We, we really realize we have, a, we have to take care of our joint welfare and our common welfare. And I think um, the project and the projects, the local projects we're going to be talking about that today are really, um, really contributing to that vision, that vision to, a, to really um, more solidarity in our society. So I'm really honored to be here and I'm looking forward to learning a lot uh, this afternoon. It's going to be quite an intense session. So uh, let me go ahead and introduce. Um, I hope everybody is, uh, is able to hear fine and see me and I know we have a, a great team here contacting we have a um, contacting each other on whatsapp just to support each other for any technical issues and I'm sure they can help you out as well if you have any technical issues on your side as well so very welcome to this conference at community land trusts building common ground across Europe um, today 4th of December we're going to be working away until until six o'clock um, we're really honoured um, to the, the fact that this conference is actually hosted and um, supported by the Committee of the Regent and hosted by uh, Pascal Smith, member of the Committee of the Regent. Um, and just to remind you, um, we're working in the context together with 10 organisations, so 10 organisations that are partners of the SHIC programme. So what does SHIC stand for? Uh, the Sustainable Housing for an Inclusive and Cohesive City. Uh, it's a project that's running over four years and, and will be, uh, so since 2017, and will be, will be finishing up next year. Um, it is funded under the Interreg, Northwest, uh, Northwest region of Europe. And um, the main objective, of course, is to support the establishment of local, local CLTs around Europe. And what we're going to be hearing today is an update on how that's going. Um, the the SHIP project is looking at promoting the model, explaining the model, and demonstrating this as a model that can work to help tackle this common challenge that we have and um, providing affordable housing to all in Europe. Um, it's not the first in the series of conference, so it's the third transnational conference that, that the, the SHIC project has run. Um, they worked on one in Lille in 2018, one in London, which I was really happy to be at, in 2019 and this one of course should have been live we should have been all together in a in a room here in brussels but of course due to the circumstances and uh, we're running this virtually today it's not the final one there will be another one coming up next spring and um, so thanks a lot for participating i noticed that the number of participants is shooting up there and um and here we have just an overview online there of uh, how it's going to be running today through to six we, after the introduction, where we, um, which we will kick off with a second, the official introduction, we will be looking at, um, at the, we're going to three panels. Um, so first looking at some experiences around Europe and looking at updates from, from London and Amsterdam. Then we'll be going to, to look at how, and this is crucial obviously, how um, important it is and how to get public support and to maintain that public support for the, the, um, the promotion of the community land trust model. At this session two, we'll begin looking at um, the, going on looking at again the importance of that public support for community land trust, but ha having another trip around Europe from Ghent to Amsterdam. Then on session three, and of course very relevant for us here based in Brussels, we will be looking at um, what the relevance of this topic is at EU level. And I think many of you who are following this topic know that it's quite a hot topic at that moment at the EU level with the European Parliament really stepping in to try and support uh, European citizens in their quest for a fairer housing market. And that will be the final session. So um, I'm going to hand you over now to Stephanie, who's going to just introduce, I think we're all getting more and more used to this. Um, work, many of people working from home and working through Zoom. Um, but um, she's going to, Stephanie's going to just remind you a little bit of some of the housekeeping rules of how this session is going to run today. Uh, Stephanie? Thanks, Olga, for the introduction. 
Um, so just quickly, uh, just a few things uh, that'll be happening today. You'll probably notice you're an, if you're an attendee, you can only um, participate through the chat function. So um, um, anyone who's a panelist and sitting waiting, they'll get promoted as they um, are required to talk. Um, also, we're recording the session. So um, there's a few of us with it recording. So we'll be able to post it later on if you don't get to see everything or there's a particular session you've missed, you can uh, check, check it later. Um, with the, uh, the chat function that all the attendees can use, um, this, we want to use this um, for you to ask questions to the panelists in the three sessions that Sorka described. So feel free to just pop questions into the, um, the general chat throughout and then someone will be compiling it and Sorka will then pose those questions to the panelists um, at the end of each session. Um, and finally, we'll be having some timekeeping. Um, this is a bit for the panelists, but just so you know, you'll get a, a, a two minute warning uh, privately by message and then otherwise Sorka will, uh, will come on to uh, make sure we stick to time because it's a, it's a nice long session and we want everyone to be heard and uh, uh, get their time to, to talk. So yeah, that's uh, it for me and I'll hand over to uh, Pascal, I think now. Hello, I hope that everybody understands me. Uh, we have some technical problems here in the neighborhood. All the internet and Wi-Fi has been shut down, um, but uh, lucky for us, 4G is there, and who knows in the future, 5G too. So um, it's a pleasure for me, not only in my name, but also in the name of my colleague, uh, Nawal Benamou, who is responsible for housing in the Brussels capital region, to, to welcome you here um, at this conference. I can just simply stay for an introduction and I want to excuse myself for that, but you know what happens sometimes to politicians, there are uh, other things and many things uh, to do. So once again, excuse me for that. But um, we are talking now from Brussels. As you know, Brussels is the capital of Europe. The capital of Belgium is a kind of autonomous uh, uh, region uh, too. It's 1.2 million um, inhabitants, 162 square kilometers. It's a very diverse city. It's um, a city where more than one out of two people are foreign born or are having parents that are foreign born. Um, and it's in a way an immigrant city. It's a city of arrival, um, which means that there is also a kind of pressure on uh, the housing in the city. And for those who know you, Brussels has been uh, having a transformation from a city for cars to a city for people, for a place where we need better quality of living, that we're doing with public space, that we're doing with the, the quality of our architectural uh, buildings, and of course the people in the city and the interaction between these three people, buildings and public space makes a city and the way you behave, the way you feel yourself happy or not happy um, in uh, a city. And I think that the COVID crisis has uh, shown us all uh, again, um, because we all know it, but it was for many people, again, I think a, a kind of moment of, of recognition of a basic fact that housing is very crucial in the way that people live, in the way that opportunities of people are being shaped. You know that um, working from home, daily home, when you have a nice apartment, a nice home, maybe even with a garden in the city is a bit complicated, but with a nice terrace, a balcony is a completely different thing than working from house in a small uh, house with four or five kids around you, with a part that has to work. Um, and so the living conditions are much more complicated. And I think that the COVID crisis has shown um, also in, um, in Brussels, like in many other European or world cities, how important is that housing is um, in, in order to have a good quality of uh, life. Like many other uh, European uh, cities, Brussels um, is uh, coping with different, um, I would say, issues of different challenges of a different nature, of course. And although compared to other European cities, we are relatively a pretty cheap city, but that's compared to other European capitals. Compared to Belgium, we are a bit more expensive. Uh, and for people living here, some would say it's becoming very expensive uh, in Brussels. Um, we see that the prices are rising, which means that uh, living in Brussels is not that easy for everybody. And so a public authority has to find instruments in order 
to um, make sure that the people that are born in the city, if they want to stay in the city, can continue to live in the city, and that the newcomers that are coming to uh, the city are not only the ones uh, that are rich. Of course, we need rich people too in order they can pay their taxes and we can have other uh, services in the city. But it's important that um, everybody who wants to live in a city like Brussels can uh, live there. And of course, there are different solutions you have. And um, I'm very glad that you're going to talk today about the CLT, because you probably know that Brussels, since 2012, was one of the pioneers, one of the leading cities uh, that started with the concept, even in 2013, if I'm not wrong, uh, the, the, the concept as such became a part of a legislative te uh, text um, uh, that Parliament has voted it, and then the, the government at the time gave an order, of an order, as the kind of partnership between CLT Brussels in order to construct 120 housings in, in, in Brussels on, on, on the basis of the concept that you all know. And now the idea is that uh, my colleague will fund it and make sure that the 120 can grow the coming years to 1,000 uh, housing places. I think it's a very good concept because it makes housing affordable. Um, it, um, it reduces the burden of buying a ground. You don't need to do it anymore. It's the house. It, it gives you the possibility to develop together with other people um, a new kind of, um, of living. And I think that the COVID crisis has shown too how important is not only having your own apartment of own house or own living unit, but it's very important how you can connect with other people, with your neighbors, with the other people in, in your neighborhood uh, on a larger scale. And so it's important in, in, in CLT projects too that the whole concept of uh, having um, parts in common, having certain services in common, that this thing is something that has to be taken into uh, account. As is, I'm responsible for urbanism and giving finally all the permits for the building, uh, buildings now in Brussels, it seems to me also very important uh, that the quality of our building in Brussels becomes more ambitious. And probably you know that Brussels is also one of these leading cities on the circle economy, that we want to recuperate material uh, in the construction um, sector that uh, when they want to develop a building, a housing, that as much we can recuperate and reuse it in uh, new buildings, that we are also a leading city uh, since many years on, on the building of passive homes, um, that also with the CLT concept, we want to continue to be one of these uh, leading uh, cities. And of course, Conferences like this give them the opportunity not only to share our practice in Brussels, but also to learn from other cities and to see how we can um, enforce and, and strengthen the efforts that we um, uh, are doing. So I'm very glad that you are having this virtual and digital conference in Brussels. I hope very soon, we'll take another couple of months, that we can be all able to meet again uh, on a physical level because digital conferences is a thing that's uh, nice, but at the same time, you don't have the, the real interaction. So I think it's, um, it's a thing that uh, we have to get over and as things are going, it will happen in the future. So I can uh, wish you for this afternoon uh, a lot of uh, fruitful uh, discussion. Know that we as a Brussels government, not only me from the urban point of view, urbanistic of urbanism point of view, but also my colleague who I have to excuse, uh, who is responsible for the housing policy uh, in, uh, in Brussels, Nawal Benamou, that uh, for us, the whole concept of CLT, uh, the community land trust, uh, is something very important. We see it as a, um, a full um, uh, way of constructing affordable housing in, uh, in Brussels, and it's a way in which we want to continue to invest and to grow um, in it. So once again, um, it's a pretty for me to host you, although it will be virtually. Uh, I will learn, of course, what you have been saying this uh, afternoon together with my colleague. Uh, enjoy your conference, take away, drink, a, stay tuned. I would like to say, don't go away, stay tuned. Drink a coffee once in a while. And uh, in the meantime, the sun is shining in Brussels. So um, enjoy the, this afternoon and learn a lot and uh, push us politicians in order to get more affordable uh, housing in our cities, especially in Brussels too. So thank you and uh, good luck this afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Smith. Um, glad you're able to join despite the technical problems and thanks for all your support. So um, I think um, that was really um, showing how important the leadership role that can be taken. So um, 
um, Mr. Smet in his position as um, not only the State Secretary for Brussels Capital Region for Urbanism, Heritage, European and International Relations, but also the role within um, the European Committee of the Region. So really putting, also making sure that we are aware of the, the importance of this issue at European level. I think this contribution and this political leadership is really welcome. And, um, and I think that the people of Brussels also welcome that as well. So I think we're going to move on now. And um, I'm really, really happy and looking forward uh, to welcoming Gert de Pau. So as I think very, I think almost all of us here today will have met Gert and have been really inspired by the, by the, the, the motivation um, that Gert shows in, in promoting um, this model and promoting uh, the right to housing. Um, so Gert has been active for over 20 years um, working on the right to housing in Brussels. Um, I'm, I'm reading that he's inspired from a visit in 2008, um, a study visit to Chaplin Housing Trust. And following that, he really started to work to advocate for the promotion of the CLT model in Brussels. But then he didn't stop there. He was uh, contributing to the establishment of the Chic partnership to really promote the model, not only in Brussels, but around Europe. And of course, uh, this is why we are all gathered here today. Here, lovely to see you. Uh, really sorry that it's not in person. Um, but please uh, give us your introduction. We don't, yes, if you can turn on your microphone, we don't hear you yet. Yes, that's you it. You hear me now? Oh, yes, yeah. now it's perfect. Thanks, uh, thanks Socha, you. for this introduction. Um, and, and hello, everyone. Um, now I finally feel safe. No more fear of being evicted from my home by the landlord. No more fear of having to look for a new apartment again and find that the rents have raised once again since the last time I looked for a home and discovered that many landlords still do not want to rent to someone with an Arab name or to a family with more than two children. For Driss, one of the people who was able to move into their new CLT homes in the Brussels municipality of Molenbeek earlier this year, moving into a CLT home was nothing less than a relief. But Driss not only received a new home from some charitable organization, for seven years he has volunteered as a passionate representative of the residents on the board of CLT Brussels. And he is one of the driving forces behind a monthly flea market organized by the residents of his new project to bring more life into their neighborhoods. The community land trust model not only makes it possible to make affordable housing permanently available to people on low incomes, it also offers these people the opportunity to build wealth as owner of their homes. And it offers them a platform to play an active role in building a more equitable city and livable and cohesive neighborhoods. One might wonder why it took so long for such a fruitful model to conquer Europe. Before going to the development of community land trusts in Europe, for those who never heard about this new model of land tenure, I'd like to explain in a few words what CLTs actually are. We do not have time here to explain in detail how it works. So I'll sum up the most important elements. Community land trusts come in many forms and sizes, but most of them have a number of characteristics in common. They take land out of the speculative market in order to manage it in the interest of the community. On that land, they develop affordable housing and other assets that the community needs. The homes are not only affordable for the first buyers, they stay affordable for generations to come. In order to guarantee this permanent affordability, CLTs often separate ownership of the land from ownership of the building by means of long-term lease contracts with anti-speculative conditions, which ensures that the building may only be sold with limited added value. And then the local community takes a central position in CLT's governance and in the development and the management of the buildings. And finally, CLTs see themselves as the steward of the land they own and plan and manage for a long term, from a long-term perspective. 
Here in Brussels, we first heard about community land trusts a little over 10 years ago. At that time, the model was still completely unknown outside the Anglo-Saxon world. Our great examples were the CLTs in American cities. Slowly, the model also began to take root in England and to take root in England and Wales, at that time mainly in rural areas. Thanks to the efforts of the CLT network. Around the same time, community activists in London were running an inspiring campaign to transform part of the Olympic Village into a community land trust. In Brussels, around 2008, the housing crisis began to claim more and more victims, and we believed there was an urgent need for new ideas to provide sustainable response to that crisis. The American and British examples inspired us to start campaigning in Brussels for the creation of a CLT. Dozens of associations, activists, and hundreds of families looking for housing joined the, initi the initiative. Soon we also received the support of established institutions such as the Fonds du Logement and financial support of the Brussels capital region. This enabled us to launch the first two pilot projects at the beginning of 2013. We soon came into contact with other people with similar ideas all over Europe. We heard that the city of Lille, for instance, was looking for a sustainable way to give families with a modest income the chance to become owners of a home in the city center. We met community workers from Ghent who, who wanted to start a community land trust and gradually uh, also the interest from the academic world began to grow and references to this innovative model began to appear here and there in the footnotes of policy documents. International organizations such as FMDV and Housing Europe started pointing out to CLTs as an interesting new instrument for urban housing policy. From this mix of bottom-up initiatives, governments interested in innovative answers to the housing crisis and commit, committed academics who were, all were looking for a new form of tenure and operational models that could respond to today's urban challenges, the SHIC project was born. SHIC, as Swatcha already mentioned, stands for Sustainable Housing and Inclusive and Cohesive Communities. Thanks to a European grant under the Interreg Northwest Europe program, these partners have been able to work together over the past three years to promote the CLT model in Europe. We had the opportunity to help four pilot projects in Ghent, Lille, London and Brussels take their first steps so that they could set an example for other cities. With the FMDV and the National CLT Net Network of England and Wales as support organizations. Recently, new partners from Amsterdam, Berlin, Scotland, and Ireland came on board. We were able to develop an informal network between all those involved in starting CLTs all over Europe. We offered young initiatives the opportunity to use vouchers to pay experts to resolve legal, organizational, and financial issues. We organized peer-to-peer -peer exchanges where more experienced initiatives shared their learning with people who just started to look, to look into the model. And we looked for final strategies to support the further development of CLTs in Europe. And finally, and this is what today's conference will be mainly about, we studied how Europe could support this young move, movement in the development of the model in, uh, in Europe. The results of the project have exceeded our wildest, our wildest expectations. In recent years, CLTs in Europe have evolved from a little known novelty into a formula that is well known within the housing and urban development sector. Many are looking at it with expectation as a model that will be able to tackle land speculation and financialization of the housing market that responds to concerns about the ecological transition and that can be at the heart of a circular local and social economy. Throughout Europe, the first urban CLT housing projects are emerging. Residents and civil society are organizing themselves to set up new CLTs and governments 
are supporting the development of community land trusts through adapted legislation, subsidies, and the provision of land. The number of urban CLTs in Northwest Europe has grown from hardly a dozen at the start of the project to almost 200 today. Organiza organizations involved in the SHIC project are now sitting around the table with major financial institutions to see how they can help us further develop our activities, thus opening exciting perspectives for the further growth of the movement. Another important objective of the project was to advocate for a favorable, for a favorable policy environment at European level. When we started the project, housing was ha hardly on the EU agenda. The attention for housing issues has increased enormously in recent years. The fact that housing is now high on the European agenda, policy agenda is of course not the merit of the SHIC project. Unfortunately, it's the result of the ever increasing housing problems in European cities. However, this new interest is a real opportunity to put the CLT model forward as a valuable tool completing more traditional social housing and cooperative models. CLTs can also meet other current EU priorities such as inclusive urban development, social cohesion and fight against climate change. To do so, we have to continue establishing new partnerships with other players. Now that we have gained sufficient experience and expertise, we can strengthen our cooperation with wider social, public and cooperative housing sector, enter into fruitful partnerships, learn from them to enable further growth, and perhaps also try influence the more established housing actors to, ad to adopt some of our ideas. Not only in Europe, recognition for community land trusts is growing. The CLT model is internationally acknowledged as a successful collaborative and anti-speculative model that helps promote cohesive neighborhoods. It has been recognized as a best practice in the UN's new urban agenda, the EU's urban agenda, and in the most recent Cities for Adequate Housing Declaration, which uh, Amanda Fletti will come back to later. Indeed, what is happening in Europe is part of a global movement. Originally, we planned to organize a major international community land trust conference in Brussels in June earlier this year. At that conference, we wanted to launch the book on common ground, which traces the growth and diversi diversification of the international community land trust movement. Not only CLTs from all over Europe were invited, we also wanted to bring practitioners from North, Central and South America, Africa and Asia to Brussels for a first truly international CLT conference. But Corona put a stop to these plans. Nevertheless, it remains an exciting feeling for us to be part of a growing international movement, a movement which through very concrete actions that fundamentally improve the daily lives of ordinary people also denounces major themes such as the perverse role that real estate speculation plays in the growing inequality in our cities. We are at a turning point where hundreds of CLT projects in Europe have emerged and been enabled to prove the case for the model across the continent. While the dynamism had led to significant innovations related to housing affordability, inclusiveness and social diversity, implementation challenges remain and certain legal and financial limitations prevent the model from thriving. The number of homes developed to date are a drop in the ocean compared to the magnitude of the housing problems in many cities and countries. This movement will only be able to have a weighty and lasting impact if it becomes easier to set up CLTs and to develop permanently affordable homes. If every new organization and every new project is a marathon impeded by countless hurdles, exhaustion, exhaustion will quickly set in. It therefore is necessary to take a step further to obtain better recognition and political support at the, at the European level in order to scale up the model. In this context, 
we invite the European Commission and the European Investment Bank to reinforce their support for the development of CLT as part of a broader right-based approach to affordable housing and cohesion policy. Further growth not only depends from EU support, it will only be possible if European cooperation is continued and strengthened. Interesting building blocks are being devel developed in different countries and regions, which others will be able to use. For example, the success of CLT supporters in France, where the national government has, was persu persuaded to enact legislation authorizing Organisme Foncier Solidaire, the French version of the CLT, and to create new type of long-term ground lease long can inspire CLT activists in other countries. The fruitful cooperation that, has developed, that, was, de that was developed in Brussels between a, a citizen's initiative and the government can serve as another example for citizens and cities that want to launch a CLT. Examples of successful community campaigns to get access to land in the UK can inspire groups on the mainland. And scholarly research, model contracts and case studies of CLTs that are already in operation can be used to inform and to inspire, to inspire new CLTs. To conclude, it is too soon to say whether this young movement will succeed in playing a substantial role in addressing the housing crisis in European cities. But a foundation has been led and a significant start has been made. In Europe, the prospects look good for further growth and greater impact by CLTs in the coming years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gert. Uh, really great to see you and to hear uh, just a part of that story that you've been on as, as the coordinator of, of CLT Brussels and um, working on the SHIP project. Um, yeah, I think it's, um, it's true to say that this is now has a lot more attention at European level because indeed uh, we recognise that the problem is, is a serious one at local level with four out of ten people um, who are living in poverty are paying more than 40% of their income on housing. So it really is a, a source of, of a, a, a big, um, uh, has a big social cost at the level of the individual, but also at the level of our cities. So um, um, every tool that can be put on the, at, on the city's desk, I think is a really welcome one. Um, thanks a lot for giving us that insight. Um, as you know, we're going to travel um, a little bit now, and we're going to be going to hear about the, the London CLT movement. Um, and we have, we have two representatives here from, from the London uh, CLT here with us today online. Mm -hmm. And they are uh, Razia Kanun, and the board member at London CLT, and Costa Cristu, and the lead campaigner at the London CLT. And just as a way of introduction, um, so Costa, um, he um, got involved through his involvement in the Advocacy Academy, it's a, that's a social justice organization um, movement in South London. And he was a founding member of a campaign for affordable housing in, in, um, in South London, and particularly in Lambeth. And Razia, uh, similarly an activist, and she was actually approached by a campaigning group for the Lambeth uh, CLT, and she felt connected with the issue. And, um, and um, became part of the, the movement for this movement for change. And now she is a community board member at the London CLT. And I think together uh, you're going to both give us a bit of an insight um, um, from across the channel. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, hello, I'm Costa. I co-founded the campaign for affordable homes in the London borough of Lambeth back in 20. 2015 um, as part of the Advocacy Academy Fellowship, which is a youth organisation um, and it's a, a youth movement based in South London, as mentioned. Um, so growing up in London, I was aware of gentrification from a very young age. Um, seeing investment in resources and spaces in my community was initially very exciting. However, it soon became very obvious to me and my friends that these were not necessarily designed for us or our communities. In fact, um, these were part of a very deliberate, deliberate effort to shift the demographics of the area. 
Um, so when meeting with other young campaigners, it became very apparent that we had all experienced um, worsening and deepening housing instability throughout our lives and our childhoods. And this was happening whilst more developments were, were popping up around our community. And the issue became very clear that when the creation and allocation of homes is solely left to the market, working class people lose out, particularly those from ethnic minority backgrounds. Um, I can relate to this, um, what Costa is uh, saying, uh, based on my time working in, in the social housing sector. Um, where over a decade ago, a housing shortage was well underway. What I witnessed was sufficient, insufficient social housing to meet the needs of the local people and affordable housing or shared ownership ha homes were being developed, which were not genuinely affordable. Our experience of private renting has been a traumatic one. Much of what hurts was saying was resonating with me. We were having to move at least once a year due to unscrupulous landlords charging extortionate rents uh, for poor quality and ad inadequate housing. With the salary freeze and the small family ever increasing rents and the cost of living, we became what was known as a jam family, just about managing. We've been forced into overcrowded living conditions. With strong links to our community, the prospect of leaving what we know to be as home was fast looming. Now, I'm not, I'm, I know I'm not alone in this, uh, facing these challenges. Our community are invested and we know what we need. So our local council, Lambeth Council, receives over 3,000 new housing applications every year. And there are over 27,000 people already on the social housing waiting list. Each year, they only house around 1,000 people. Um, as you can see, this is completely unsustainable and um, speaks to the need for fast solutions that have the potential to alleviate the crisis both in the short term and also in the long term. Committee land trusts seek to serve those in the squeezed middle, as Razia was speaking to. Those who are not necessarily eligible for social housing, but can't access private housing in the market generally. Um, however, this model can also set, open the door to more community developments um, being supported by local authorities um, and providing more affordable and social rent options in these properties. And it generally makes the building and allocation of housing a more bottom-up process. I got involved with the CLT, as you've heard, through grassroots level door campaigning. Um, I found the Christchurch Road Steering Group at a crucial time when we, my family and I, uh, have been considering leaving what we know as home. It quickly became apparent that community-led housing schemes were the only viable solution to a housing crisis I had left in the making 10 years prior. On a personal level, being involved in the steering group of the London CLT became a self-development project I've met some um, of the most amazing and inspiring people along the way. Um, they've given me a new lifeline at a time when I was losing hope in society and myself. Um, it has provoked me into thinking how we can develop further in order to deliver these homes. I feel it's necessary that we send shockwaves with our presence. Um, it's a realization that I actually had when I was addressing um, our deputy mayor. We need to capitalise on this crucial concept of social impact and facilitate the empowerment of more of our local leaders. If we can do for others what the CLT has done for me, we'll be well on the road to saving our communities with more leaders leading more campaigns and more genuine affordable homes. So despite the campaign being a five year process so far, I started it when I was 17 and my colleague was 18, um, we've had to endure the landscape of a worsening and deepening housing crisis. Um, since. So since we initially started the campaign, there have been a number of changes in the area that have exacerbated the need for action as part of a wider context of worsening conditions in the city as a whole. Um, for example, we established our community steering group almost two years ago, of which um, Razia was an integral member and still is. Um, but we've seen a number of our key members of the steering group leave for personal and professional reasons. And the cost of living in London and opportunities elsewhere has played a massive factor in people leaving the city and therefore the, the steering group. Um, the current pandemic, as we all know, has compounded the need for safe, secure and affordable housing. As many industries have been obliterated, unemployment has increased rapidly and key workers are being placed under increasing pressure to de deliver frontline services in healthcare, education, transport, etc. The need for social security for families and working people has never been more evident. 
um, especially in the wake of the Grenfell tragedy, which happened in 2018, and the families still do not have justice. And this has really shaped the legacy of housing work in London on a wider scale. So despite the pandemic, Lambeth Council have, um, their planning committee has recently approved a 20 storey block in what is historically a low built working class area of the borough. Our MP, Helen Hayes, along with many local housing campaigners and local residents believe this is being used as a means to approve a luxury development of apartments. And we fear that cash strapped local councils um, in need of resources and capital will continue to sell off land, which could otherwise be used for affordable housing um, in the coming months and years as um, European economies um, struggle responding to the economic conditions of the pandemic. Of course, to mention the inaction and delays when it comes to building and supporting the building of CLT homes will lose the momentum built up by so many who are jam. It will lose the leaders and their skills who have campaigned for CLT homes to improve the living conditions of their communities. Given the pandemic that we've had and the disparities within housing, particularly for those in racial communities, racial minority communities, um, we will be losing out on a lot. Um, it will waste the opportunity for building truly affordable homes, which are supported by these communities who have been invested in these communities. Without action, the cycle will only continue. With action though, we can scale this solution, not only to improve the housing crisis, but to maintaining and helping local communities flourish and support one another. Thank you very much, uh, Razia and uh, Costa. I think you, um, this, um, this concept of just about managing is a really crucial one and it's really, to this jam concept, it's really relevant for unfortunately more and more people and it just shows you how important it is, as you say, to, to not to lose hope and to, um, to stay engaged, but also, um, as we've seen, Pascal Smith, and you mentioned also local support from your local politicians, how important it is to bring that voice um, also to the to our um, to our politicians, to our decision makers, to really bring home to them that this is an option, um, and they can they can there are ways to deliver more affordable homes for those that need it, and the value that that can bring. Um, I think hearing your story has been um, really inspiring, um, and um, I know, I'm sure that people also want to uh, pose questions. So what, what they are doing is, so after the next speaker, there will be an opportunity also to, to address some of the questions that are coming in. So I would just remind the participants that you can, you can, um, you can type in the questions that come to mind uh, for the speakers, and we will get to those after this session. Um, for the moment, we're going to travel um, up to Amsterdam and um, very happy to, to bring in uh, Jeroen van der Welt into the debate, into the discussion. Uh, so Jeroen is the Strategic Policy Advisor for Circular Built Environment in the city of Amsterdam. And um, we heard already from Pascal um, in his introduction that um, he sees the CLT as, a, as a, an important tool in the, the quest to have a more circular economy. So that is interesting that that is also recognized not so far away in Amsterdam. Um, he is. Um, he really wants to um, develop um, more circular criteria uh, by 2022 in the city of Amsterdam, and he's contributing to this process by working on policy tools in order to help all the stakeholders. So please, your own. If everything is fine for you technically, we're very happy to hear a little bit more about um, what's going on there in Amsterdam in this field. Well, thank you. I hope you can. Uh... Hear me? Yes, that's working fine. Yes, okay. welcome. Thank you. All. Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jeroen van der Waal and I work for the uh, city of Amsterdam as a strategic uh, policy advisor for the circular built uh, environment. And uh, since in summer, I've been involved in the Amsterdam Community Land Trust project. And this is uh, closely supervised by and the people, if you all know, maybe. Uh, I've been asked to provide a view of the CLT project from the perspective of the Amsterdam Circular Strategy. And I'm honored to be able to contribute to this uh, conference. The central theme of my pitch is 
Uh, can we, it's, it's on the former, uh, <laughs> can we, uh, uh, the other way around, uh, I think I'm, sorry, I cannot, um, my, uh, my slides can we can get can they get back uh, to, uh, to to the front one because I don't. Are you any... using the arrow keys? Yeah. Yeah, I was, but oh, there it is. I didn't, there it is. I yeah, <laughs> but I didn't do it myself. Okay. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, this one. Yeah. Uh, because on this slide you can see what uh, the central theme is. Uh, can we consider uh, community land trust in Europe as an inclusive development of the circular economy? and thus increase political tension for the community land trust. And I'm explain why I'm uh, con considering this. Now, now I'm trying to get the next slide, but it seems not to, oh, it works. Um, in Amsterdam, we will be working to accelerate the uh, transition to the circle economy. And our approach is to set the target of greatly reducing the use of primary raw materials and of becoming a fully circular economy by 2050. Uh, I'm sorry, it's, ah, yeah. Well, I think it's becoming of, uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, in the circular economy, we reuse raw and other materials over and over again, and we avoid waste and close the cycles. We learn to do more with less. Because in a circular economy, the value of raw materials is retained as much as possible throughout the product's life cycle from the design phases to disposal. The built environment is one of the focus chains within Amsterdam. Because as a municipality, we have a relatively large influence on it. Talking about the circular economy, it can be represented as a donut. Uh, the Donut model was developed by Kate Raymouth, a British economist working for the University of Oxford and Cambridge. And she wrote the Amsterdam City Donut, a framework to make our city circular. You can see it on the left. We look at the city from four perspectives, the social one, the ecological, but also local and global. The inside of the donut, you can see on the in the middle one uh, under the thriving city, uh, represents the lower limit of prosperity needed for a socially equitable systems. This involves income and work, but also good health, social networks, and political participation. Uh, you can say this is the social foundation needed for a thriving society. A foundation which can reinforce in the circular city, both locally and globally. The outside of the donut, also the, the yellow part, represents the ecological limits of the planet, which we must respect in order to grant others the same broad prosperity as we have here. Examples are climate change, nitrogen saturation and biodiversity. Together, they offer a new perspective on how Amsterdam can be a home where people flourish in a thriving place while respecting the well being of all people and the health of, of the earth. During the summer, we realized, we realized that in one of Amsterdam's neighborhoods with a low average income level and various social challenges in the Belmer. A project was ongoing that fits perfectly in the donut and in the circular inclusive economy. And to be honest, it also took for me some time to realize it myself. It was the CLT in the Bayern. This is why the CLT Bayern project is included in the realization of the municipal circular strategy. And that's also why I'm here, making this pitch on behalf of the city of Amsterdam. But why does the community land trust fit so well in the Donald model? Well, the CLT is an example of how lasting neighborhood involvement and cooperation can be organized. The project stimulates alternative ownership models 
for sustainable and circular area development. And all target groups can participate in order to build 40% of social housing. Nowadays, only well-educated people with the knowledge and networks participate in building their own homes. But in the CLT, people are all participating at a high level and they are learning how they can influence their environment. But what is the contribution to the ecological goals of the Amsterdam Donut? Well, apart from these social contributions, I also see opportunities to contribute to goals of ecological sustainability. Uh, I have some examples here. Well, a community of Lentwist can build homes with a low ecological footprint that are, that are also adaptive, adaptive homes. Uh, the CLT purchases as a collective of sustainable domestic appliances, fixtures, facades, lifts, solar panels, with options for repurchasing or even lease construction, kind of as a service models. So with the, the goal that the CLT needs less primary materials. And the last one is extending, extending the lifespan of the buildings and all other stuff in it through a better maintenance and repair. This create more employment locally, we hope. What is the current state of the project CLT in the biomass at this moment? Well, there is a uh, democratic neighborhood association and it has been established. The association is connected with a construction group whose members are future residents and who will develop and rent the buildings. And the other part is that we have uh, uh, established an expert team in a field lab setting in which various municipal staff members like myself and specialized companies in Amsterdam are participating. Well, what are we going to do in the next six months? Well, of course, the donut, we want uh, it translate at different scales. Um, we will also produce technical and social use cases, which we can use to make housing or aspects of it more sustainable and more affordable for the development neighborhoods in the Belmont. The aim is to put theory into practice. We are going to create a framework for how to integrate circular economy with alternative ownership models for neighborhoods, buildings, and residents, and users. Well, I'm now coming to the end of my presentation. As I explained, Amsterdam takes a broad view of the circular economy by using the donut as a basis for local growth and for a better world. The CLT environment is a great example of a project that brings together inclusive and ecologi ecological ideals. And we, will, we will be testing various circular use cases in the coming period to gain some more experience and scale up within Amsterdam, the Netherlands and Europe. One of the reasons we are here together online is that we all want that community land twists receive much more attention in Europe and in the future. This brings to me to the following three considerations. Can we consider the community land trust in Europe as an inclusive development of the circular economy? And can we increase by this the political attention for CLTs? The next question that arises is how can we ensure that CLTs receive more attention in the European Union as a means of implementing the inclusive transition to a circular economy? And last consideration is, does it make sense to focus on CLTs as a realization of the circular economy action plan or other parts of the EU's Green Deal? Well, thank you for uh, your attention and special thanks for uh, uh, and the people, Joris and Yip, who helped me to create this talk. And I thank all the people who work together in CLT to make a better world. Thank you for your attention.
Thanks a lot, Jeroen. I think uh, we've managed uh, to have a really uh, diverse session. So I think we Gert has put the, the, the CLT movement in the context of addressing the, the affordability uh, crisis that we are facing in many of our, especially in our urban um, centers. Um, Razi and Costa have given us a bit of an insight from the, from the grassroots level of, of what it's like to, to gain support. And then Jeroen has put it into the, into the picture of, of course, the bigger challenge that we all face, how to make our, our way of life more sustainable, also in the context of, of climate change and, and growing inequalities. So it's been really good. And I think we've got a few, a couple of questions coming in that the colleagues are receiving on the Q&A and then sending through to me. And um, um, the first one um, is addressed to Costi and Brazia. They want, and they, they want to hear a little bit of, of more about the public campaigns because it's maybe uh, perhaps not something that is um, that all over Europe is, is um, as familiar a concept. And they want to hear a bit more about um, the, the experience you had in delivering that campaign and maybe what other cities could learn about the, the London CLT campaign. So that was what the question coming through from participants to hear a little bit a bit more about that campaigning side, how it went. I think it'd be fine if either of you or both of you want to come in on that. Um, I think Costa's given a lovely response in the web chat, so um, you might want to read that. But um, oh, yeah, to build on that, um, public campaigning, um, if it wasn't for public campaigning, I wouldn't be involved in this project. Um, mm -hmm. so, so quite simply, absolutely, it does have an amazing effect. Um, CLTs, I didn't know CLTs existed. Uh, we were having one built in the east part of London. I live in the south part of London. I did not know such a thing existed. And um, my involvement with the CLTs has been literally a whirlwind campaign. And I, um, it's what keeps me ticking every day, uh, knowing that there's this campaign going and not just for my benefit, um, but it was a realization that I had along um, my campaigning with this particular steering group that so many people do need to hear this because there are many people out there, much like myself, who need this but don't know it exists, who are isolated, who feel lonely, who feel frustrated, um, possibly depressed, that don't know that there's a solution, a viable solution, a very real solution on our doorsteps. So public um, campaigning is, I think, in my opinion, absolutely crucial in this. Um, we had a, um, a campaign um, last summer um, of 2019 where we were reaching out to um, our local community um, in our town center, and we had an amazing impact it was nobody knew we were going to be there. We were just reaching out to strangers walking by. The amount of support that we received from our local community was just affirmed uh, what I felt um, and was encouraging in the fact that we are on the right tracks. So public campaigning, I cannot um, recommend it enough um, because of the way the CLTs work, uh, because of the way the housing market works in this country, we have um, the odds stacked up against us, so to speak. Um, we're breaking so many barriers and so many ideologies here. Um, we are, we're working against the tide somewhat. Um, so I think public, public campaigns are both exhilarating and absolutely necessary. Thanks a lot, that's it. Costa, would you like to bring in some more insights on that? I think Rosie put it perfectly, but as an addition, just yesterday we had a session with Tony Pickett from the Grounded Solutions Network in the US, and he, um, he affirmed the history of CLTs as something that went hand in hand with justice, and particularly racial justice. So I think as the concept becomes more well known, known in Europe, across the continent, it's really important that we keep the model grounded in its roots, which is to tackle inequality in its starkest forms. And I think housing encompasses so many aspects of inequality and is really a very material um, manifestation of um, things like racism, economic inequality, um, and so many other hardships that people face to disproportionate levels and it's across the continent. So I think with public campaigning, you can reach these communities that you wanna serve in a way that is accessible and speaks to their experiences, in a way that speaking purely from an academic perspective or an economic perspective just won't. 
and it's a very long and hard process and it's highly collaborative but in the long term it means your impact is far beyond just the people you manage to house in the short term. Uh, thanks a lot. I think these are really crucial points, this uh, reaching out and uh, uh, particularly at the moment, uh, Razia, you mentioned a lot of people feeling isolated in despair. Or, and I think that's even more, even more true at the moment. And um, maybe I think, I think you obviously have got a lot of hope and encouragement from the, from the journey yourself and you're, it's inspiring how you'd want to reach out and share that with as many people as possible. So yes, this ra raising awareness is crucial. And um, I hope that has answered the uh, participant's question. I'm sure that you can get in touch with Razia and Costa to get uh, even more inside information on that. So we have another question that was addressed to, to Gert or, or Jeroen, uh, going more into the ecological perspective. And then just maybe if you want to highlight a little bit more how you feel um, the, um, the CLT or what has been described here today is uh, sets itself apart in ecological terms uh, from other current developments. Why is it? And indeed, why is it classed as having a higher ecological performance than other current models? So that was the question coming through. Yes, thank you. Well, I think one of the, the biggest advantages <coughs> is that uh, the community has a long-term view for investment. And uh, that's uh, very important when you have to make some investment for sustainability. Nowadays, uh, the, there are much builders who have a uh, much shorter uh, review of uh, long term, maybe it's uh, two or five years, then uh, you cannot uh, make the investments for sustainability. So that, that's one thing. The other thing is that as a community, uh, you can purchase what I said easier uh, with, with bigger uh, amount of, of money. Uh, from uh, all the community itself and not by the individual members. So then you can uh, easier get a uh, good contract if, for instance, as, uh, someone who's getting uh, of who's uh, obtaining a service as a product as a service. And I think the, there might be some more chances when you have a community than when people get uh, alone or uh, the more established uh, corporations who are dealing also with the same sustainability goals, but uh, they come from a well, different angle. Hmm. Thanks, you Indeed, the long-term perspective is crucial yeah. in the community, community power. Yes. Gert, did you want something to add on that? But I can also tell you that there's another question Gert, that where they want to hear just more in general about how the movement grew in Europe and the difference between the different models. So maybe you want to touch on both. <clears throat> Okay. Well, I think Jeroen already said the most important about the circular aspect of it. I think something central or in, in, in this is the idea of stewardship that is important in the community land trust model. Um, for us, it is simply not possible to think in the short term because as a owner of the land, we are responsible for, the, for what happens on, on the land. So we have to build homes from which we are sure that they will be um, still uh, uh, good homes, not only affordable, but good quality homes in the, in the, in the very long term. And up on top of that, there is the involvement of the community that guarantees that the homes will be uh, used uh, in, a, in, a, in a proper way. So I think it's really um, a, um, a very uh, appropriate form of organization to uh, fit the circular econ economy. It, it is the way of organizing uh, that, that can be used to, uh, um, as an answer to the, the technical answers that, that are being developed now uh, for, for building more uh, circular, on a circular way. Um, and then your other question was uh, the different uh, types of community land trust uh, being developed in, in, in Europe. Uh, well, indeed, it's, it's true that, um, uh, as I said in my introduction, uh, community land trust come in all forms and, and sizes and shapes. Um, it goes from very uh, small uh, initiatives completely uh, uh, initiated by, by citizens who want to, for instance, we, we have been uh, 
in contact with groups of, of parents who want to uh, build uh, affordable homes for, for disabled children, for instance, using the community land trust model. And on, uh, in France, for instance, where cities want to uh, shift uh, all of their uh, affordable housing policy to the community land trust model to make it more sustainable and, and long, longer lasting. So it's very different in, in shape. It's also different in the way communities are involved, uh, but always uh, these, uh, these key elements uh, come back. And that's also one of the interesting aspects of the community land trust model that it's very flexible. It can be used in very different contexts. Yes, uh, thanks a lot, Gert. And we have another um, question coming through, but um, actually to all speakers, um, wondering if there are specific examples of donations of land or buildings to, to CLT. So just think about that for a moment before I, I have another one that's addressed also to Jeroen or Gert, um, and asking about potential comparison between operative model and the CLT model? That's one question coming through. Obviously, we know there's an overlap there, but do you want to address that? <clears throat> and they, they specifically asked about that in Amsterdam or Brussels. So how they will be valued in comparison to each other, CLT or cooperatives. I think, Gert, maybe you want to come in and maybe your room? Okay, I'll, I'll answer to the first question mm -hmm. first. Uh, we are very happy to uh, to be able to say that in the last uh, few months we uh, we received uh, two uh, properties. Uh, so one of uh, a family who who uh, I don't know how you say it in English, but who uh, um, who leaves us uh, their land and their home uh, after after their their death, um, and also a family who has. Uh, donated uh, a, a property in, in Brussels to, to our community land trust. So we see that this model really uh, interests uh, a lot of people. Um, and, and I think that's also one of the interesting parts of it. We can, of course, I think it's, it's important to say that it's almost not possible to, to make a CLT run without uh, government support and without subsidies and financial investments. But uh, the model also makes it possible to, to, to bring in other, uh, other uh, assets, uh, people giving land, people giving homes or people investing um, without, uh, without financial benefits in, in the community land trusts. That's the, the community aspect of it that makes it interesting for, for, for that kind of uh, actions. Mm -hmm. yeah, and if I may add from uh, the Amsterdam view, um, you ask about the, uh, well, the more traditional uh, corporations, uh, what they do and the CLTs. Well, uh, we've made some new policies uh, this year that the uh, uh, more innovative CLTs or also building groups to get some more space to have uh, new uh, grounds which are uh, given by the municipality. So uh, it, it, uh, it's going to, to enhance to, I believe, 10% of all the uh, to building housing, uh, which will be given to building groups or CLTs in 2025, I believe. So there is an increasing part uh, in our city which uh, could be realized that way. But that doesn't mean it's always a CLT. It could also be some uh, uh, groups of, uh, well, uh, more the well-being <laughs> um, people, well-educated who are trying to get a, a new home with, uh, with a group. So the city working to diversify the offer. And um, there's a question to all speakers, and I think then we're going to start to, to wrap up with the last two questions. Um, but one um, participant asking, what is the best way people can support the, um, from the grassroots movement to support the CLT, CLT movement where they live? I think we already heard from Gert examples of, 
of donations, but if there are other examples of that, the best way people can support. And then the last one to Razia and Costa, obviously a very um, a relevant one, um, the impact of COVID on the community work and um, any experience you'd like to share on the digital organizing of the, of the campaign and keeping up those connections in the community. So let's wrap up on those. If you'd like, if everyone would like to come in and say, what's the best way people can support? And then maybe Razia and Costa also on that um, point of how COVID is impacting. Well, for the first question, mm -hmm. uh, well, it depends, of course, where you live. Uh, you, we have a, a very good, good documentation on our Chic website where you, you can find also maps with uh, the different initiatives all over Europe. So I would recommend you to, uh, to go and look on the map and see if there are community land trusts in uh, the neighborhoods where you live. And then if I can uh, talk from a Brussels point of view, um, well, one thing is, of course, we are, we are, we are running now a, a, a fundraising campaign, so you can, uh, you can make a donation, but also uh, we are in the process of, of starting uh, a, a real estate cooperative uh, that we want to be an alternative for, for the private market um, developers who are becoming more and more uh, well, gaining more and more power uh, in the way our cities are developed. Uh, and so this, uh, this cooperative will depend really on, uh, on citizen support. So follow us uh, about that and become member of our cooperative, I'd say. Okay, a lot of different ways there. Kev. Maybe Raz Razia or Costa? Um, I think in terms of um, supporting um, CLTs, um, grassroots level campaigning, um, it is important to share the word, even if you can't get involved. Not everybody can get involved at all times, but it's crucial to have a group, a collective uh, supporting at all times. Um, so just to repeat, you don't need everybody involved at all times, but we need support at all times. Um, so the more people uh, that you share the information with, the more uh, outreach there is and the more um, consistent support there can be. Um, coming back to the challenges of COVID, um, it has been extremely challenging to try and maintain um, uh, the campaigning effort. We um, had quite... Um, a very strong and large uh, steering group uh, prior to COVID. Um, and slowly we saw numbers dwindling. That's various reasons. Um, Zoom fatigue, I'm sure, is um, <laughs> very prominent. Um, and it's quite easy to um, fall out of your routine where before you would go to work or you'd have your daily routine in the evenings we used to have our meetings. Everything's blurred now. Home, work, personal, everything is just one long linear line there's no separation anymore um part of my attempts to mitigate for that um was reaching out to um my steering group um colleagues uh, individually um for me i am extremely passionate about our steering group project and CLTs um in general um, but i also appreciate not everybody has that time that they can afford um and not everybody will share that same enthusiasm. Some will need a little bit more encouragement. Um, so it's about reaching out to what it is about the CLT that appeals to them. Um, and what is, I find quite um, interesting is um, when you recount your stories about your journey thus far, um, speak about the challenges you've faced and then the big wins that you've had. They might be far and few in between, but sometimes those wins are really big. Um, when you make an effort to... Um, make note of the individual contributions that each member has had it it makes them realize how valued they are and it's really important to keep revisiting that um, in people understanding just how valuable they are they are much more likely and willing to continue to contribute um, so there's various things and various steering groups and uh, CLTs will have different challenges um, for us um, it's we've got a lot of um, obstacles that we're facing with our local authorities. So it's been a very long 
drudgy uh, journey, um, which doesn't help. Um, so it's about recognizing those challenges with your colleagues and encouraging each other, I suppose, um, on a much more one-to-one -one level um, to make everybody realize just how important each individual contribution is. Really important point. Costa, would you like to add? Yeah, just from my experience, because I primarily work with young people, those who are um, 16 to 18. And I think, especially from those the, um, who are from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, the crisis has, has really impacted them in a lot of very different ways. But also, if they haven't got access to their own space in their homes, they don't have a very good internet connection, they haven't got their own laptop, it can become very difficult to reach these people. And I think from that perspective, if you have partners who have additional resource or happy to donate materials such as laptops or even um, tablets to uh, members of the community and kind of pooling resources together, you can find a way to reach people. Um, just to reach on to a question that was asked later about mental health. Um, in this crisis, we have found that people have been using a lot of crowdfunding and also reaching very deep into their networks to find resources. And I think one of the benefits of building a very wide pool of networks even if they're not highly engaged is that you can call upon them in times of crisis so i think a massive learning from the pandemic has been the benefit of having something like a a membership structure even if it's just like a newsletter and galvan galvanizing their support when it's needed in order to have these connections and i think raz's point about one-to-ones is really crucial if you can reach someone individually and have a phone call with them to give them a break from the screen and make them feel valued and give them a sense of optimism that we're still momentum even going through the crisis towards the post pandemic climate that will really help them feel like there's hope and on that point i think when you um can make zoom calls are very engaging and very interactive with people and ask their perspectives and give them a space to open up about their experiences at the moment and make them feel less alone that can do wonders for both their mental health and also the health of the campaign in terms of avoiding burnout. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some really valid points there. Thank you all so much. I think it's been a, it's a really insightful um, session and um, thanks for your availability. I think uh, you'll probably get a lot of follow-up questions and contact after that. Um, so we're going, speaking of breaks, we have just a really short comfort break of, of two or three minutes at this point until we, we move to the next session. Um, but um, thanks again, and I hope you you will stay on for the rest of the of the session too. I hope to meet in person at some point. Thanks a lot. I think we're ready to kick off again. Welcome back, and we've another um, another session really focused on the public support for community land trusts, and we're going to go back across the the channel. I hope Tom has managed to join us, and a really happy. Um, to meet you again, uh, Tom Chance, uh, co-chief executive of the National CLT Network of England and Wales. Um, a quick introduction to Tom. So, I hope you're there already, Tom. Yeah. Uh, so, Tom is sharing the position of chief executive with Catherine Harrington. He joined the CLT Network in May uh, 2016 and now leads the network's projects on finances and operation building the charity into a strong and sustainable organization. You're also, Tom, you're also working on the charity strategy and business plan and building relationships with the house building community, with the finance, local government and community sectors. So I think we've heard a lot already about that important nature of the work of, of CLTs working with very many different partners from the, the individuals that they are providing housing too, but also to many other partners. So that's going to be interesting to go into that aspect in more detail. I hope you've already managed to join us, Tom, if you're there. I have, yes. Oh, yes. And then just if a little note to, hi, lovely to see you again. And just a little note to everyone that Tom <clears throat> won't be able to wait till the end of the session. So you can already um, um, start adding in, typing in some questions directly to Tom. So he will address those straight after his session. So Tom, please give us a bit of an insight into the the National CLT Network. Okay, thank you, Sorsha. Um, and it's a real pleasure to be to be here at this conference um, and to have been involved in the Sheep Project over the last few years. Uh, I've been asked to talk about particularly the Community Housing Fund, and we had hoped that we'd have somebody from 
our Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government able to present on that, but I'm going to do the job for them instead. Um, our mission at the National CLT Network, England, England and Wales, is to mainstream the community ownership of land and affordable housing. So we don't want community land trusts to just be a niche which takes a huge amount of effort and really exceptional individuals or communities to pull off. What we want is for this to become part of the mainstream of, of, of housing provision in this country. And to that end, we have over the years worked on developing what's called a theory of change, where we look at the process that a community would need to go through in order to learn about the opportunity and take it up and then successfully deliver uh, and either building or refurbishing housing for a CLT. And we look at all the barriers that exist and why that isn't happening more at the moment. And the Community Housing Fund is one major policy achievement which we've had in, in England, which came from an analysis of two particular barriers. So the first was looking at financial barriers to delivering community land trusts. And we, along with uh, an, an academic and uh, counterpart at the co-housing network in England, did a study in 2017, which was funded by Power to Change, looking at the financing landscape, all of the available private finance, public finance, social investment that could be brought together to support the delivery of a community land trust. And we broke the process down into five stages, looking at forming a community land trust in the first place or developing the concept for one. The second stage, finding a site. Third stage, securing planning permission and developing the plans for the scheme. The fourth stage, building the, the homes or doing the refurbishment. And the fifth stage, people then living in those homes. And we looked at the different sorts of finance that would be required at each step. And what we identified were key gaps in two areas. One was in those second and third stages of finding a site and then developing your plans and securing planning permission. You need revenue funding at that point. And as a new organization, accessing that through a loan was extremely expensive. And there were very few options for that. There are only one or two social investors that have funds that are available. And so it's a big barrier for a lot of community land trusts not being able to get the funding to do that part of the process. The second barrier is when it came to them building the homes, because community land trusts are trying to develop a form of affordable housing, which is not the standard in the UK. And so the national government sets out a prospectus of the sorts of affordable housing it will fund in England or the Welsh government in Wales. And those products are things like affordable rent or shared ownership, but they don't include the sorts of products that London CLT, for example, has developed, which is a form of discounted market sale with the prices linked to local incomes and with a permanent discount. So London CLT, like many other CLTs in the country, have come up with innovative forms of affordable housing, which are more genuinely affordable for their local communities, but you can't get capital grant from the government to fund that sort of project. So you might be able to get it from the land value or some other source, but if you need a capital grant, which is commonly the case for affordable housing in England, you're stuck. So those are the main financial barriers. Another significant barrier was access to support. And in England, we run a scheme uh, providing access to some technical advisors since about 2009. And we, through the Sheik project, have delivered a similar scheme across the Northwest Europe region giving groups or communities or organizations access to somebody who can come and give them some advice on how to get started. And that has been successful and it has led to many CLTs starting. Over the same period, a model has been developing in England, learning from previous examples like secondary co-ops, which we have found that is much more effective, both at hand-holding groups over the, throughout the entire project, rather than just being there to give a bit of advice at the start and also developing the market locally by working with landowners, the housing um, industry and local government to build understanding of and support for CLTs. So we came up with it, they've, they've gone through many different names, but the current word, the word we use to describe these organizations are enabler hubs, and they work at the level of a city region or one or more counties um, in, in England. So they're local enough to have, have their the, the sort of local knowledge and understand the local context and, and big enough to operate across a wide you know, an area to make them financially viable. 
And where these have existed, we've seen the fastest growth of CLTs and also the highest success rate. But these are very patchy, they don't exist across most of the country. And they often find it difficult to access people with the professional skills and knowledge to give good advice to CLTs. So in looking at these barriers in terms of finance and access to support, we also identified that the same barriers faced not just CLTs, but also housing cooperatives, co-housing communities, and other community-led or collaborative housing approaches. So this work was following a policy success we had um, pulled off in 2016, which is to get the UK government to commit to establishing some sort of fund for community-led housing in England. And when that was announced, we then started doing all of the, well, did a lot of this detailed work to put the, the detail around what that should then look like. The government finally opened the Community Housing Fund in 2018 with revenue and capital funding, as we had suggested, and also about six million pounds of investment into that infrastructure of enabling organizations and professional training. And it's been hugely successful. So it has, in about the space of about two years, grown the pipeline of homes being brought forward by community-led groups by from about 6,000 homes two years ago to 23,000 homes now. And of those 23,000, obviously a lot of them are very early stages, but there are 10,000 homes in projects in the system of the government's funder called Homes England. So it's seen a huge growth in a sector that in the UK has been very, very small for a long time, a long way behind the collaborative housing uh, sectors in other European countries. And for community land trusts, it's also been hugely successful in establishing their credibility as a model, both with government nationally and with all those other parts of the industry in their different regions. And at the national level, government now is increasingly acknowledging the roles of community land trusts. So for example, it's recently brought out white papers on reforming the planning system, and the social housing sector, and both of them had several mentions of community land trusts and the role that they and community-led housing can play in the British housing system. There's also been a study commissioned by our Prime Minister into what the government should learn from the COVID pandemic, and in particular looking at the role of local communities in responding to the pandemic. And in that report, the MP that was commissioned to write it identified community land trusts as a, a positive development and suggested they should be the future of social housing provision in the UK. So that's not yet government policy, but it is the view of one MP that was commissioned by the Prime Minister to look at the question of the role of community following the pandemic. Um, the Community Housing Fund has been a huge success, but it is currently closed and we have been lobbying a lot this year with our members to get it reopened again. And it remains to be seen in the future quite how secure the role of CLTs is in national housing government policy. But it's certainly been um, a, big, a big success in recent years to, to grow the sector. And we would be really pleased to see similar kind of developments elsewhere in, in the UK and elsewhere in Europe. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Tom. Uh, I think you really outlined the importance of that um, identifying the obstacles and supplying the training and handholding, as you called it. So just before you head off, I know you have to head off. There are a couple of questions that have been, are being passed through by the team. I have one wanting to know more indeed about the advisory service in a way and these enabler, enabler hubs and to know a little bit how they are um, resourced and staffed. And um, coming from that, what would be, let's say, key advice or recommendations to, to, uh, to your colleagues across Europe? Sure. Um the enable hubs at the moment are all quite different. So it's, a bit, it's not really possible to say there's one way of designing mm -hmm. them, but I would recommend if people are interested, looking at a piece of research that we helped commission, which is also funded by Power to Change, written by Pete Duncan and Joe Lavis. I don't know if it's possible, I could provide the link to the organizers to provide later, or you can just look up on the Power to Change website, do some research into enabler hubs, looking at historical antecedents, looking at recent developments in the UK and also further back. I think that the key thing is to, that they have all been looking to develop as social enterprises, so generating income, they're not just grant funded. And the main two models that have worked in the past have been where enabler hubs charge a fee as part of the development of a housing project and they can get that at the point which the, home, the homes are built. And so you just need to sort of cash flow your work up until the, the, the project is completed and then you get paid your fee for helping to complete the project. 
The other is management services. So very often community land trusts or housing cooperatives, they're too small or they benefit from having an external agency support them on the management of their housing and their governance. And so you can build a business around that. Mm -hmm. um, what I would recommend is that in other countries and other regions to look at that research and just think about the similar sort of thought process where, you know, where are the business opportunities and how can you structure that support infrastructure so it becomes sustainable and doesn't require, doesn't depend upon ongoing government support. The reason I say that was that there was a very strong support, support infrastructure for housing cooperatives in the UK in the 1970s, but it was entirely grant funded and when the grant funding stopped, it all disappeared. So we're trying to use grant funding now to kickstart something that will outlive government interest. Yeah, and there was one last question indeed related to your last point on that before we before we go on to our next speaker um, um it, how CLTs can best can position themselves to indeed access uh, funding mm -hmm. yes um, well as a, as a very broad question um I think that there are many many different sources of funding and in fact you know, FMTV did replicated our research as part of the Sheik project across the rest of the European region and the list of funders and sources just becomes ever longer the more <laughs> the more countries you take in. Mm -hmm. um, the main thing is to always, we've emphasised to CLTs is often, you know, they're coming from a community perspective, they want to try to provide affordable housing, they have all these social values they want to bring to the project, which is obviously the entire point. You need to figure out how to marry that with being a business and looking at fundamentally having a financially viable proposal that you're looking to develop um, and then you can sell yourself really effectively to funders on the basis of that social value you're saying well we've got this fundable proposition that's going to do so much more good why don't you want to come and fund us mm -hmm. yes i think you've, you've covered it in a nutshell it's a broad question but indeed the, the financial sustainability um, complemented by the, this the social value narrative thanks a lot tom uh, for joining us I realise you do you, you can't stay till the end, but um, I'm sure the conversation will continue throughout the, the meetings with the, with the Schick partners over the remaining part of the project. We're going to go to France now, and I see that um, Jean-Marie Kemener is already there. Thanks a lot. Lovely to see you. Um, and just a quick introduction. Um, you've been working as an engineer for over 10 years within the French Ministry in charge of environment. So we've heard a lot about the importance of uh, support from uh, public authorities at different levels. So great to have the voice of the ministry. And um, now, you, for, for two years, you've been in the General Directorate for Urban Development, Housing and Nature. So a nice mix of topics there. And you're in charge of the urban development and urban innovative issues. So really looking forward to hear from you, uh, Jean-Marie. If you'd like to go ahead. Hello, thank you, Stephanie, and uh, hello to, to everybody. Uh, thank you for giving me the, the floor and the opportunity to present some insights of the development of the OFS in France. I will speak about uh, OFS instead, instead of CLTs because it's a name uh, in France, and uh, OFS stands for Organisme de Foncier Solière, which is um, the name in France of, of, the, of the CLT. And uh, I will particularly focus on the fast trade of the OFS in France and their funding sources. So I have to click on the, uh, okay. Um, first of all, uh, I'd like to, to, to explain how the system is developed in France. Uh, the legal framework of the OFS uh, has been put in force uh, six, year, six years ago. Um, and however, a legal framework is not enough to make this new tool operating. The pioneer, like uh, the cities of Lille or Rennes, did a, uh, an hard work to convince the stakeholders of the, of the affordable housing public policy to get on board, like banks, real estate developers, and notaries. And three years later, uh, eight OFS were approved. In 2018, uh, the government convinced of the opportunities given by the OFS uh, to fight against the real estate speculation has improved the legal framework. Two measures have been taken. Uh, the housing under BRS are fully part of the social rental housing policy. 
it's uh, very new. And they are taken into account in the social housing quotas set for all cities. And the second one was to well, that, that the range of the structure are provable as OFS has been widened and as forward social housing operators and local public enterprises in charge of urban development and services can be recognized as OFS. The key principles stay in force, non-profit organization and contro controlled by the state representative at the local level. And in the same time, the pioneer have built uh, a network to share the bottlenecks and solutions to tackle them. Uh, uh, the OFS development speeds up, and today we have uh, 50 uh, OFS agreed. In terms of housing development perspective are twice more than expected last year. 20,000 uh, 20, housing under BRS should be sold by uh, 2024. And affordable housing was a key topic during the mayor election campaign in spring. A lot of mayors elected took strong commitment to develop an affordable housing offer. For example, Lyon will put on the market a thousand affordable housing each year. And you can uh, see on the map on the right of the screen um, the spread of the OFS model in France. In green, you have the OFS approved. Uh, in orange, the, the OFS project uh, under review by the state uh, authority. And in, in uh, yellow, the OFS in project. And you can see that the OFS um, model uh, spread in the French, uh, French overseas territories like uh, on, um, East Caribbean, uh, East uh, West Indies, sorry. Guyana uh, and Ile de la Réunion. Uh, ah. Okay. Sorry. Um, at national level, um, I will speak about the measure taken to support OFS development and especially about uh, finance support. Uh, at national level, the government provides a strong support of the OFS, uh, especially in the field of economic means. Uh, first of all, successively measures have been taken within the framework of the finance laws. Uh, two main objectives are aimed. First one, alleviate the tax burden of the OFS. And the second one, recognize the finance law. In the finance law, um, the social characteristics of the OFS, uh, and by the way, alleviate the, take, the tax on the households and secure their solvency. In general, it's, in general, it's about to align OFS taxation on social housing national policy. As you can understand, uh, uh, sorry, uh, as you can understand, it's done gradually, very gradually. And the explanation is, um, in fact, uh, this tool is still very new On many stakeholders struggle to understand how the system works. And some of them were very reluctant facing the principle of a separate approach between the housing property and the land property. We still must have a pedagogic approach when explaining what the WFS uh, are and what the opportunities they could provide for the cities and the householders. Uh, financing for OFS was a worry, um, and I would like to underline the key role played by uh, a French actor which uh, called La Banque des Territoires, uh, if I try to translate, uh, Bank of Territories. Uh, La Banque des Territoires is a national public bank who support local development projects led by local public authorities or local public operators. And the funding tools provided by La, par la, by la Banque des Territoires are bring, bringing by the household deposits made in the framework, framework of the banking product called Livret A. It's a very common uh, banking product in France. And the Banque des Territoires has developed a banking product called, called uh, Le Pré Gaia. Uh, it's a loan, and this loan is dedicated to public operators carrying out local projects. 
And the specificity of the, this loan is the, um, its duration. The duration uh, of the loan can be between 60 or 80 years, and it allows the OFS to buy land or real estate pieces at market prices, and then amortize the, uh, the investments in a long term. It's a very supportive product for the, for the OFS. And in parallel, uh, several actors of the social housing policy are working out a funding offer based on equity investments. Uh, an organism like uh, Action Logement, uh, it's uh, hard to, uh, to, trans to translate this name in, in English, but it's an organism, um, and this organism aims to develop an affordable housing offer for employees. And in that perspective, Action Logement collects and manage the contribution of the French companies for the housing of their employees. And uh, housing, uh, Action Logement is um, providing to OFS uh, equity investments to, uh, to allow OFS uh, of uh, buy uh, lands and uh, build new, new projects. In certain several cases, uh, cities gave, uh, give OFS investments in kind, for example, uh, land, lands or real estate species. And uh, I'd like to underline that the National Agency for Urban Renewal can also provide subsidies in the real estate operation led by the OFS if the operations are, are related to um, renewable uh, development. Jean-Marie, if you have... Yes. Try to speed up, because if you can... Yeah, 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 sorry, as a conclusion, I, 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 I come to my, to my conclusion. Um, the, in France, the OFS model has risen high level of interest. Uh, it's a concrete tool in the hand of mayors to tackle the lack of affordable housing in city centers, for example. Uh, the OFS model is an opportunity to give a second life to social uh, renting housing, and the social housing operators are very interested in selling under BRS housing in order to keep their, in their social aim. And uh, this is a success. There are challenges, uh, for example, the competition be between OFS uh, in the access to land. Uh, it's, uh, it could be an adverse effect uh, fighting the land speculation. And we have maybe some problem um, in competition between the OFS BRS uh, model and the social rental housing model. Uh, in the short term, we will, to, we will open the, the model uh, uh, on two axes. The first one, uh, maybe to sell um, BRS housing to right households to aim a, a kind of social mixity. And we will open the BRS system to uh, business premises to aim a functional mix mixity in the, in the city center, for example. Sorry to jump in again, Jean-Marie, but yeah, I realize I think you can stay also for the question and answer because I know that yeah. our next speaker is in a bit of a rush. But um, thanks a lot for those insights. And uh, again, the key, the long term finance being key there. Amanda, I think you're going to join us now. Really happy to welcome you from the United Cities and local governments. And uh, many of us might be familiar, particularly with the, the International Declaration, Cities for Adequate Housing. Uh, where you got 40 local governments to sign. Uh, so very happy to have you with us. And please, uh, Jean-Marie, hold on to join the, the Q&A after Amanda. Please go ahead, Amanda. It's okay for me. Great, thanks. Um, that's working now? Yes, you can hear me now, right? You're a little bit faint. Uh, let me try to, is that better? If I maybe took a... Yeah. Is that fine? Yes, please go ahead. I think it's better. I mean, I just I will just take up the mic <laughs> if it's yeah. better. Can you understand? Yes, can you can you hear me well? Yes. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So, um I'm I'm sorry because I will not be able to stay until the end uh with the video call, but I will stay through the chat and if there is any question, please feel free to reach me uh through the chat and I will uh make some answers. Uh, would you please launch the, the 
PowerPoint presentation. I think that's happening behind the scenes there. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so I will not uh, be too long on the presentation of UCLG and the Committee on Social Inclusion, but just uh, for the one who doesn't know us, um, we are an international network of local government. Um, we aim at building the voices of local government uh, at the international stage and, and particularly to, to show how the experience at the local level, how uh, the vision, how the initiatives led by local government can contribute to face the most pressing challenges uh, of our contemporary world. Um, and that's a little bit the, the frame of, of UCLG, no? Uh, you can go please to the second slide. So I'm the, the coordinator of the Committee on Social Inclusion, Participatory Democracy and Human Rights of UCLG. It is a special committee created by local government for local governments in the perspective of the right to city and, and human rights, um, trying really to, to, to defend a vision of uh, building more inclusive city uh, based on the defense of, uh, of the human rights at the local level uh, and promoting uh, the right to city as one of the main vision uh, where uh, we can put the needs of the inhabitants at the heart of the urban fabric and also renew the social contract uh, with this commitment. So uh, this uh, concrete commitment of uh, uh, regarding the right to city and the human rights uh, also um, has been questioning a lot the way to make local policies at the local level. And during uh, Habitat 3, you can go to the next uh, slide, in 2016, Yes, actually the, yes, thank you. Um, so in, in 2016, uh, we, uh, we participate to Habitat 3, um, the International Conference of UN Habitat regarding housing, uh, and housing uh, has been clearly identified as one uh, priority for our constituency, uh, and also one priority to develop this vision of the right to sit in what it means at the local level, no? And, and, and centering um, the, the topic of housing, the right to adequate housing as uh, a way to really empower uh, the citizenship uh, and empower the, the, the rights at the local level. So during Habitat 3, we had kind of a momentum where uh, we decided um, with U the UN uh, through the Special Rapporteur on Adequate Housing, through um, UCLG and, and the constituency of local governments and through civil society networks, and especially through the global platform of the right to city to create kind of an alliance uh, between these different kind of stakeholders uh, to bring uh, at the center of the discussion at the international stage, uh, all the priorities, all the emergency regarding the housing uh, rights uh, from a local perspective. That uh, led us to start working uh, on what it means to, to, to build housing policies uh, from uh, local government, um, exchanging experience, of course, but also willing to build this international advocacy work, um, trying to defend what can be the initiatives led by local government, can, which, which can be enhancing uh, and impacting concretely um, the improving of the access to adequate housing for all. Um, so the achievement of this uh, working process we had since Habitat 3 was first uh, this international declaration on cities for adequate housing, um, which aim as, it has been actually the first international declaration from uh, local governments regarding the housing topic and addressing uh, the most impressing challenges like gentrification, the, um, like the regulation of market, I would just, uh, after that, with the main context of this declaration, but it's important to say that uh, we are still uh, having more uh, local government joining this declaration, which is kind of the reference document uh, regarding the housing rights for uh, local government, uh, and which led to a second important um, milestone for us, which was the creation of the UCG Committee on Practice of Housing to have uh, two process one of advocacy and another one on concrete experience led by local governments. Um, next slide, please. So the Cities for Adequate Housing Declaration is based on five demands, more powers to better regulate the real estate market, more funds to improve our public housing stocks, more tools to co-produce public private community driven housing, and this is the point uh, I will um, explore with you today. 
uh, an urban planning that combines adequate housing with inclusive and sustainable neighborhoods and a municipalist cooperation in residential uh, strategies to improve uh, the exchange of knowledge of practices of concrete initiatives at the local level no so i would just focus on the point three because it's the one related to um our discussion today uh i think that it's very important that this point uh yeah to say that this point was we had a lot of discussion between uh, our members regarding this point because it's like the most innovative one uh we know how to do um, social or public housing we know uh how to 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 build tools to control a little bit um the housing stocks but everything which uh is linked to um the community driven alternative housing solutions is quite the innovative part of the declaration no and um, it was a strong commitment from, uh, from the signatories, the local government, uh, to highlight the necessity to improve the relationship uh, with the civil society initiative regarding housing and empower uh, the citizens also uh, in the way they can uh, create an innovative solution on housing. So uh, I, I put on the slide the, the text of the declaration regarding these this specific points. Uh, and I think it's important that because it reflects a little bit this idea of of going beyond uh, the normal uh, tools of um, public policies regarding housing and really trying to hear what can be uh, the initiatives uh, led by by civil society, but also uh, recognize the solution um, that they are uh, creating to face uh, the housing uh, issues. No, because we know that governments it can be at the local level national level we have always once we are always uh, for definition um, one step after the the demands of social movements uh, and this idea was also to uh, see how we could improve maybe the recognition from local government on the initiatives led by by social movements regarding these housing uh, rights so um, I also, after that, uh, could you please go to the next slide? So I, 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 I wanted to share with you uh, the experience of Montevideo. Montevideo is one of the signatory city of uh, this declaration. Uh, it's a um, pioneer in the policies led in the field of housing cooperatives. They have more than 30 years of experience. Most of you might know. Uh, this experience of Montevideo regarding um, cooperatives. Um, but I wanted to share with you a little bit what they are uh, doing now, because I think it's interesting to see how also how you can uh, advance in a, in a public policy, because of course, uh, um, providing housing policies, I mean, can always be improved and local government are also trying to improve uh, years after years the way they are uh, responding uh, to, uh, to these most pressing challenges. So uh, Montevideo is the capital city of, um, of Uruguay, um, very committed to defend so social justice and the right of people, especially in the access to, uh, to housing. Uh, the capital known uh, has been experiencing um, a commodification process and, and gentrification dynamics at the center of the city. Uh, and worried by the situation, they decided to develop um, a first action, which was uh, um, a land bank um, in, in order to provide uh, access to urban land to the citizens of uh, Montevideo. So um, they started thinking on how to ta tackle a little bit the gentrification process and ensure the access of citizens and to urban land, and especially to the more uh, the poorest uh, citizen of uh, their city. Uh, and they try to help uh, inhabitants to develop their own housing uh, solutions to enable the right to city. So um, the, the first tool they have been developing is the one I just mentioned here. It's the special fund for urban management, um, which was a way to, uh, to, to create like a, a local tax uh, on the current existing uh, a market on, on housing so they could uh, feed the land bank with new uh, with new land uh, and, and always have a consequent uh, offer of uh, free urban land to make projects with the citizens. Sorry, I need to so, jump in uh, again there, this huh? project, 
has been developed in, uh, over the years for different kind of actions. Uh, it's important, for example, um, to, to enhance maybe the, the experience of this FinCAS project, uh, which was the aim was to recover abandoned uh, private land and turn it into a concrete social use through new uh, housing and habitat projects uh, and also filled uh, the, the land bank uh, launched uh, 30 yeah. years ago. Um, this this uh, yeah. current project is also uh, nurturing uh, specific needs from special groups, for example, women and children or homeless people or uh, trans communities uh, and, and providing housing with special attention to these specific needs uh, and also having uh, going beyond uh, housing projects uh, uh, to, to also talk about the rights of the communities at the local level. Um, so I think that's a very um, uh, creative way to, to include housing uh, in, a, in a wider understanding of, of human rights at the local level. Um, and this project, I think, has, is also interesting um, because of, uh, for example, they develop a very new approach of cooperatives also, which is uh, the dispersed cooperative tools, uh, which, which protect think... residents from yeah. different oh, kinds of see. buildings, living in different uh, uh, buildings, but from the same area, which is exposed to strong uh, speculative uh, pressure, uh, and develop kind of a decentralized uh, cooperative uh, on that. Um, yes. Manda? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, oh, so, sorry, I couldn't hear you. Oh no, that's fine. No, very interesting to hear about the concrete, uh, the concrete example coming also um, after the insight into the declaration. But it, we would like to move on to the the next session, and it would be great if you can also share your slides and uh, be available for people who want to find out more about the monthly video and other examples. I think there's a little bit, a bit of a delay there as well. So thank you very much. I know you're also in a rush to go. So, so we'll just uh, close yes, my presentation here. Uh, it's yes, fine. Thanks thank lot. you so much. Thanks for that insight and the concrete examples coming up from the declaration. Yes, we're going to move on to the next the panel discussion. And there's a context for Amanda for those to, who wish to reach out to her. Um, so we're going to move on to our um, panel discussion and please, um, Jean-Marie, if you can hold on also to the end, I know there are some questions coming up for you as well. We're really happy um, again to welcome um, three representatives. So we have the head of housing department from the city of Lille, Caroline Lucas, the deputy mayor from the city of Ghent, uh, Dina Heze, and deputy program manager of circular economy from the city of Amsterdam. And so, I hope that you've all managed to, to link in. Caroline is there? Yeah, I'm here too, Salome. Oh, very good. Salome. Yes, are we all there? Caroline and Tina? I'm here. Yes? You hear me? I'm here. Ah, you're there. Great. And Caroline? Lucas? Is there as well? Can you? Okay, can you hear me? Perfect. Yes, uh, wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. Wonderful to see you all. Thanks for joining the discussion. Um, so I'll just give a quick um, introduction so that um, our participants have a little bit of background. Uh, so Caroline, you, you are the Vice uh, Deputy Director, Deputy Director General. General. Of, um, of the Quality and Development Poll and Director of Housing Department in the city of Lille. And you've been working for over 20 years in housing policy. Uh, so we're really looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, Tina, you're over there in Ghent. And uh, since January 2013, you're a Deputy Mayor of the city of Ghent. Um, you've been a City Council member for the Green Party since 2000. And um, Currently, you have a big portfolio combining housing, energy, climate, international solidarity and environmental policy. So really bringing together a lot of the, the topics we are looking at in, in today's session. And we have uh, Salome. Um, 
Gaillard, and then you've been working for the city of Amsterdam, deputy program manager again on circular economy. So you've heard a little bit about that already today. And then your background, it's interesting, is an international design and engineering firm, Arup. You worked for them for more than a decade. So you're coming from a different sector. And on a larger scale, you've been working also on urban integrated development. So really looking forward to getting these different perspectives on, on the, the affordable housing challenge and the role of, uh, of CLT, the CLT movement. So we've prepared a couple of questions for you. Um, so I hope you're feeling ready. Um, first of all, to kick off uh, Tina, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, Tina and Caroline. Basically, uh, we want to go back to one of the core themes of today's session and to hear about the local policy support in favor of CLTs, or of course the OFS en français, and or cooperative housing. And we want to hear a little bit also about the ambition, ambitions of your cities to go further on this topic. So maybe Tina, you'd like to come in first, and then Caroline. Okay, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, to answer the first question, what is our city doing for affordable housing? The first question is, what is affordable housing? And then uh, the second question, and that is very related to the first one, is affordable for who? Uh, because for some people, it's no problem at all to buy a house of 600,000 euro or to rent a house and pay 1,500 uh, euro a month. But for some people, and it's a quite large group, those figures, they can't even dream about them. So affordability always has to do with uh, the relationship between the family income and the living expenses. And so that's the very uh, first thing that I wanted to, to mention. Now, um, I'm deputy mayor um, since eight years, but I'm only deputy mayor for housing since two years. And uh, in the, um, the, the last two years, we made a major shift. We made a major shift, why? Because um, we realized that the affordability question is really the issue of the rental market, of the rental market. And so what we, as, um, as a city, we decided only to focus on the rental market, at least for, we, we only want to give financial support to the rental market and not anymore to the purchase market. So there was a major shift. And uh, so what we want to do, because we do realize for the people uh, with the 20% lowest income, the only, the only solution for them is social housing, the social housing, the, the uh, social rental housing sector. And we have our, this sector in Ghent is about 12%, but that's too low. It should be, uh, on, on longer term, at least 20%. And the people just above it, uh, they should um, be able to rent houses, uh, but rent houses, what we call budget rental houses. So we invest, even if in, in theory, um, the social housing sector is uh, not uh, something that a city is, is responsible, responsible for, we did decide that also at city level, we want to invest in social housing and then in budget rental houses. And there's one exception, and that's CLT. Um, CLT is of course not a rental uh, formula, but it's a, a purchase formula. But of course it has a big advantage with uh, typical uh, budget, housing, uh, budget housing. So before two years ago, uh, ago we still subsidized in a way uh, budget housing. Uh, to, so people who normally can't afford to buy a house to help them. But it didn't work because what in the end we subsidize just starters, people who maybe have it a bit difficult uh, to buy a house at a certain age, but if they save some money, in the end they will be able to do it. So, um, so we, we, we just shift from, from, the, from that and just focus on the rental market but with the exception of CLT, like I mentioned before, why? Because of course, CLT has sufficient qualities and balances so that even in a purchase formula, there's sufficiency guarantee of long-term affordability. Because in the other budget housing formula, what you do, you subsidize a house, 
a, a person buys it and then, okay, if this person leaves the house, it might go to another person who doesn't need this budget house. But with CLT, of course, you are, there's guarantee that uh, even on long term, it helps people uh, who normally wouldn't be able to buy a house and are really at a low income, that they still can do it. And as a, as a city, uh, you don't also lose control. You're sure of the long term um, um, guarantee of uh, affordability. So you know, I'd, like to, I'd like to really focus in on that point there. Of course, the long term, and we, it's come through a lot um, this morning. And, and just to hear, um, please hold that thought as well. And just to hear a little bit also from, from Caroline, um, how in your city you are, you are supporting also this long-term dimension and supporting the development of, of CLTs and OFS. Oh, your microphone, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Is Thanks. it okay for you? Yes, that's perfect, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Lille is the 10th uh, city uh, of France. Uh, we are the center of, the, of a, big, um, a big metropolis of more than 1 million of inhabitants. We, are, we have a very strong tension on the um, housing market in Lille. Um, we are the third most expensive provincial city in the rental market in France and the fifth one uh, in the existing market. And at the same time, um, Lille's median income is 17% lower than the national one. So we have a very problem with um, too large uh, lower, lower income people. Um, for a long time, uh, Lille is, is committed for, um, for a mixed city uh, model open to all. And we have a local housing policy focusing on affordable and social housing. Uh, we have 26% of social housing in Lille. Um, for 15 years, um, we tried to develop um, home ownership for lower income people. And um, it, it is really a success because uh, we have now more than 2,400 affordable ownership units sold. Um, how, how can we do that? Uh, we have for, for 15 years a long policy, a strong long policy. We have a lot of subsidies and we have a local law in a urban plan. Uh, in Lille, um, in every project of, of building, uh, developers must project um, 30 to 45 percent of affordable housing. Um, the result is um, for 15 years, uh, for 45 percent of the new construction is affordable. So, it is a success, really, but uh, this program is very expensive for, for public uh, finance and it is not really efficient socially. Indeed, even if we have uh, anti-speculation clauses, affordable housing is not permanently socially oriented. It goes back to the free market at the first resale because the first buyer can sell its home at the price he wants. So we were looking for a new, uh, a new model of affordable housing, but without any success. The, um, we were working with um, a lot of local house authorities in a, in, a in a national network, and we studied the CLT model, but all the lawyers uh, told us it wasn't possible to translate the CLT model in French right, in um, Romano-Germanic right. But we met the CLTB and the CLTB has a right uh, more um, nearer, nearer than, um, than our. Um, we exchange with, um, with CLTB and we, we bring this model back in France. With our deputy, Audrey Linkeneld, with our partners, 
the city of Lyon, um, the, the housing ministry, um, a notary, uh, the Fondation Abbé Pierre, Abbé Pierre Foundation. Uh, we create a new legal system to separate land and build. Uh, I'm not going to explain the French model. Jean-Marie Kemener has explained it. Uh, <laughs> So uh, I think it's clear, but what I want to say is the birth of the French model of CLT is a European cooperation with the CLTB. It's important to tell us. We, in Lille was the first uh, CLT in France in uh, 2017. And today we have, um, we have 15 homes inhabited with uh, by uh, by um, zero fs in addition we have we are selling 89 um, homes new homes our ambition is to develop uh, 150 homes a year from uh, 2021 and um, from now we want we are going to generalize all home ownership with the office model we think um, the conditions of the successful development of BRS of OFS homes in our city um, is an attractive selling price because in Lille we uh, we sell uh, the the OFS um, homes uh, about uh, two thousand euros per meter, including tax, to uh, two thousand four hundred euros. And we have a limited rent for the land, about 60 cents to one euro by meter. We have a, a strong local partnership dedicated to the buyers, and we have a strong land policy. Um, for us, the, the CLT is really um, an opportunity to, uh, to uh, offer um, affordable housing for low-income people and to, um, to um, decrease the urban sprawl and its negative and impact of environment. Yeah, I think yes, uh, hitting a lot of uh, birds with one stone and that um, um, very much like also to hear also from the environmental perspective um, from Salome in Amsterdam before we jump back uh, to Jean-Marie. Um, Salome, where does this, um, what we are speaking about today, where does it fit in the, in the sustainability vision for the city of Amsterdam? Thank you, Sertia. Yes, well, from our point of view, um, sustainable housing is housing where people really like to live, where they feel super comfortable, where they fit in the context, uh, where they are empowered, where they're part of a community, uh, this in itself, if people feel super comfortable in their environment and at home, this in itself is future-proof and thus sustainable because people like to live there and like to stay there, hopefully. Uh, and besides that, um, this ownership model, as I said, that, uh, when you're empowered uh, to deal and to own your environment, um, this uh, leads to sustainable solutions, we believe, because if, if you uh, are in control, if you know that the house will be yours for a longer period of time, that is, it's very um, um, interesting to uh, come up with sustainable solutions because you will also um, reap the benefits from that. And as my colleague Jeroen um, introduced earlier this afternoon, for us, this is almost the perfect combination within this donut that he introduced. It's the social foundation where you empower people and make them feel part of a community combined with this ecological ceiling uh, that they uh, can add to or can play a role in. So this is, uh, for us, it's very interesting that the CLT movement is combining these two and we see that as an important factor in the development of our city. And as you also explained this afternoon, we, I understood that by 2040, 10% of the housing stock in Amsterdam should be CLT. So that's, that's pretty impressive. And uh, we're only just getting started. So um, I'm very happy that uh, we're, we actually have these ambitions and um, looking forward also to work with the community on 
not only the social aspects, but also the ecological aspects of this uh, urban development. Indeed, the green of the mind is something we really have to fight for. It's a, a green, and so not only a green deal, but a social deal. Um, but that brings us um, back to Jean-Marie, and just to, I know we cut you short a little bit earlier on, but we'd also like just to hear an overview in a way of what from ministerial level you think are the, the key um, support that can be put on the table for, for the development of, of the CLT model. And then just to warn everybody, in the, in the last roundup, we will go back and we see very much from this conversation how the cities of Europe, and you have three excellent representatives here now, are aligning a little bit their vision in, in, in their, how they need to step in and ensure that housing is affordable for citizens. So I'd like to hear just a bit about the relationship um, uh, to the SHIF project, which is at European level, and what you expect also from European level and from the, the European partnership. So I think, um, just think a little bit and we'll finish up like that. Um, and Jean-Marie, maybe you'd like to come back and just wrap up on how the, at ministerial level, what the key supports uh, that you see you are providing for, for the movement. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> oh, your speaker is off. Sorry, your microphone is off. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's, a, it's a hard question. I think that um, uh, the French government is very committed to develop um, WFS and CLT model, and we we support development um, in different way uh, by the law, and we, we are trying to improve the law, the finance law to to support the development and to alleviate the burden of the taxes, for example. And we are working with the private bank sector to, to encourage a private bank to, to design a bank offer for uh, household, households uh, who want to buy um, an affordable housing. Uh, it's hard to convince um, national banks uh, to, to design a, a, a special offer for, for, for BRS. And, and we, are tr we are trying to, to explain um, what is OFS BRS. And I'm, I'm thinking um, about um, very specific situation we have in, uh, in overseas territories where we are um, pro um, problem like, um, uh, smuggle maybe uh, we have a, a lot of poverty and um, OFS BRS model is a is a way to fight and to to fight poverty and to to make a, a, an housing uh, offer which is affordable for uh, poor people in in overseas territories. And sorry, on that point, Jean-Marie, and the, um, we have a question about the income ceiling. So you say you're addressing um, poor people, and do you what? And um, do you have more information about the limitations on income ceilings, and if they are different to other models? Uh, I have no precise, precise information, and it's very, it's for me very hard to to explain that. Uh, mm -hmm. We have two way to fight. Um, the problem of poor people and the first uh, way and the first classical way in France is a rental housing offer mm -hmm. and we we have put in force laws to uh, we have set rules to to demand to the cities to build a um, cotize of uh, social rent, rental housing and it's hard to convince uh, rich uh, the richer cities to 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 make a, an affordable housing uh, offer uh, in place. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, hard, it's uh, hard for me to explain the, the, mm -hmm. the whole dispositive. I think that um, we will continue exchanging on that information, but it's, yeah. it's going to the, the, the key point. And um, I have another question. So yes, we will, the, um, that I want to just wrap up by asking you all about this this relation with the SHIC and the, the importance of this uh, the, the European level. But I also have another um, technical question that has come in for Salome and Tina, uh, just before we get to that last point, um, asking, do the Netherlands and Belgium guarantee that you cannot demutualize a cooperative, uh, i.e. sell it and share the profits between members? So what 
is there a protective is there a protection against the demutualization of the cooperative that is a question that came through so if you want to address that but also the the other point about the the eu level um well and don't ask me about this start with salome yes and then maybe tina yes um, yeah, don't ask me about the, the technical details because it's not my uh, my specialist. But yes, I'm I'm convinced that we have uh, we have covered that. And uh, I, I guess selling the land and splitting it up that is going against everything that CLT stands for. And and maybe that's another point that I would like to make in addition to uh, to my initial comments about uh, empowering and ownership. I think something super special about CLT is uh, collaboration and the sharing aspect of it and that is so very important in the circular economy that we're striving to um, as well so uh, besides this this long-term view and the i guess efficiency uh, in some ways of uh, living together and sharing things it's also an exchange of many more values and this is actually at the core of uh, the circular transition as well it's not only about money it's really about all kinds of values that you share and uh, that you value. So I guess if that's at the core of a CLT, there, there can be no way right. of, uh, yeah. of uh, splitting it's, that up. It's really um, bringing it all together, the question of values. Maybe you'd like to wrap, up, uh, wrap it up, uh, Tina, with the last point before uh, we go into the break, short break. The last point, you, what, what we want to reach at the European level, is that mm -hmm. the question? Uh, well, um, I have a bit, in general, uh, it seems a bit in, in a different view than some of the other panelists, what's, what's fine. Uh, I don't see, or we don't see a CLT as the solution for poor people. I don't believe in that. That is only the social rental housing sector or budget rental houses. But, of course, CLT is, is a very um, good formula for people just above it, who still have low income, but not the poor. So I think mm -hmm. that's very important. And, but okay, that might be already, because that's what all uh, should happen at European level. Maybe yeah. by sharing uh, our uh, um, experiences, we might learn if, if, if there might be ways how CLT could be for poor people. Still, I don't see it, but uh, let's share. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, exactly, this, and it's what it's all about, this sharing of experiences. And, and uh, I think the most important thing is that the the governments and local authorities are engaged in this issue and realize that that engagement is crucial for people. And now we're going to have a five minute break before we come back at, um, at 4.30 to hear from Kim von Spallenpeck, the member of European Parliament. So a very short break. Thank you so much to all of you, to Jean-Marie, Caroline, Amanda, Salome, Tina. Thanks a lot for, your, for being here and for sharing your, your knowledge on that. So welcome back. Welcome back after that very short comfort break. I think we are ready now to welcome Kim von Spallenpeck, Member of European Parliament, as we move into the, the last session of the day. And um, it's been really inspiring so far, but now we, we get into um, the the EU dimension, so the EU support for, for community land trusts and of course for more broadly decent and affordable housing for all. So um, I think we all are aware of the fact that um, housing is indeed a very local, regional, national issue. The EU um, d does not have direct competence when it comes to the issue. Therefore, it is quite a complex uh, task to deal with this at European level. But um, as Gerrit mentioned earlier on, it has come to the point where, um, as we mentioned, four out of 10 people um, in poverty are paying almost 50% of their income on, on housing and the levels of homelessness are also rising. So it is an issue where, which has come to the attention of policymakers and also um, the awareness that many EU initiatives do actually have an indirect impact on the capacity of local authorities to deliver affordable housing for, for people. Um, there are a number of initiatives that are going on at the moment which are relevant. So many of you may have heard of the European Pillar of Social Rights, which does recognize, um, in a non-binding fashion, but does recognize the, um, the, um, the right for people to, 
people in need to decent housing and the need to address homelessness. Um, so we, and we, there are a number of initiatives going in the right direction. And that's why we're really, um, really, really happy to, to welcome Kim, uh, Kim von Spanenthal, uh, because she has been working tirelessly um, as rapporteur of the Decent and Affordable Housing for All Own Initiative Report of the European Parliament. And um, she had a major success this week as it was approved by her committee. So I think she's going, to, she's going to be joining us and telling us a little bit more about her aspirations for this report and also how we can all work together to make sure it actually means something for Europeans. Kim, are you there? I think so. Yeah. Yes, you are. Yes. yes. No, I yeah. <laughs> Hi, Hi Sorcha. Thank you so much. Us. Yeah. Well done on your report on getting it through. That was uh, no easy task. So we're really happy to that you could join us here today to tell us a little bit more about it and where you see us going from here. Yes, uh, thank you so much for the invitation. I uh, already uh, had the opportunity to uh, follow the, the previous panel and uh, I think it's, it's always very inspiring to hear you know, the efforts that are taking place on a local level because I really feel that you know, all the efforts that we're doing to, uh, create, to make sure that we have more decent and affordable housing in Europe is really interconnected and uh, you know what what we do in your in the european level will influence uh, what's happening on a local level and i can definitely say that a lot of the things that are happening on a local level have inspired me a lot um, in the work on my report so um yeah i i am the rapporteur on the report of access to decent and affordable housing uh, for all in the european parliament and uh, this Tuesday, the report was adopted in the Employment and Social Affairs Committee with a pretty good majority. And um, I think this European Parliament report comes at a crucial time when housing insecurity and household debts are rising and we risk a steep increase of evictions and homelessness. And in the writing of this report, it became clear that European policies are sometimes better at protecting making profit on the housing market rather than protecting the people who need a roof over their heads. EU policies in different domains have an important impact on this evolution and that's why the EU has to really step up its game. And my main goal with the report is to ensure that we treat access to housing as a fundamental right again. I came across the community land trust model as an inspiring model that allows for citizens to be involved um, that provides affordable housing and security of tenure for the people that need it most and is an antidote to the speculative spiral that we see on the housing market through a commons approach that challenges traditional conceptions of ownership and the liberal market logic. I think it's not a coincidence that at local level it's often green politicians that are implementing it in their cities. The model needs indeed stronger recognition, um, a regulatory framework that is enabling and financial support through EU funding. I'm pleased to tell you that this is what the European Parliament report is calling for and that the community land trust model is specifically mentioned in it. And uh, I think this is one element of an EU approach to housing that acknowledges housing as a fundamental right and not another market for investors and financial intermediaries to make huge profits. Um, I would like to present seven highlights of the report now that are relevant also for the community land trust model and that of course have to be part of a wider approach embodying its core values. So first of all, I think it's important that we, had, that we get an integrated European strategy on housing because if we see that there's a housing crisis in all of Europe, um, the European Union can no longer hide behind the fact that it has no competence on housing policy. The macroeconomic and fiscal policy of the EU has a huge impact on housing affordability and exclusion. The EU needs to step up its game and come with an integrated strategy on housing using different policy fields that are not always the first in your mind when we think of housing policy. Banking supervision, regulation of non-performing loans and mortgages, the economic governance, market rules, competition rules. Housing affordability needs to be better reflected in the European semester. The reference threshold for the housing cost overburden rate stands at 40% today. And this doesn't represent the actual situation. It should be adapted downwards. 
Next, uh, one of the calls in the report um, that we had a very large majority for is to set a European goal of er eradicating homelessness by 2030. I expect to see strong action to combat homelessness as part of the action plan of the European pillar of social rights. And we have to be ambitious and the EU should live up to its values by setting a goal together with member states and civil society to eradicate homelessness by 2030. This assault on human dignity and extreme form of poverty is unacceptable. The Commission should support member states to achieve this goal by proposing an EU framework for national homelessness strategies. And in those plans, member states should prioritize the provision of permanent housing to homeless people and put an end to the criminalization of homelessness. We also need to take action to fight evictions and create more inclusive housing markets. There is a rising financialization of the housing market from buy to let is to institutional investment by means of real estate shares and foreign capital capital and buy to leave schemes. Right now, housing is treated more and more as a tradable asset to make profits with. And the Blackstone Investment Group also in the beginning of the COVID crisis already communicated that this pandemic provides them with a great opportunity to invest in residential real estate. EU policies in different domains have an important impact on this evolution. And that's why the EU really has to change its ways. The European Commission must assess and propose where appropriate new laws to counter the financialization of housing markets by mid 2021. I believe that member states and local authorities put in place tax measures to counter spe speculative investment. We also need to better protect mortgage borrowers against evictions and ensure that there's a transparency on the real estate ownership. Right now, many tenants have no way of knowing who hides behind the investment schemes and is really their landlord. We need to regulate the real estate markets and put in place urban planning policies that prioritize affordable housing and the well-being of the community. EU rules should not stand in the way of this. Cooperative and community-led projects such as CLTs are an important element of this. We also all know that we need to increase Europe's affordable housing stock. Providing affordable, energy-efficient housing for low- and middle-income groups is an important measure to ensure everyone has an affordable and decent roof over their heads. The Commission should adapt the target group definition of social and publicly funded housing in the rules and services of general economic interest. And this will enable regions and local authorities to build more social housing and provide it to a wider group. The current definition is too restrictive. Member states should also be allowed to invest more in affordable housing under the EU's fiscal rules. The revision of the Stability and Growth Pact pro provides us with that opportunity. There's a shortage of social housing in Europe and the investment gap is 50 um, 57 billion per year. This is immense and we need to see a huge leap in the provision of public and social housing. And we also need to mobilize funding through EU programs and the EIB. Of course, as a Green, I also want, need to mention the European Green Deal. The renovation wave can play a big role in providing healthy, adequate and accessible housing, reducing energy costs and helping alleviate energy poverty. Emissions reductions through housing renovation in the social housing sector and for worst performing buildings have a high potential to achieve these combined goals. Social investments in this field provide for new jobs and energy savings. The renovation wave has an important potential to help kickstart the economy and therefore should be prioritized in the MFF and in the recovery and resilience plans of member states. We should achieve deep renovation of 3% of the European building stock per year. Another big problem that we see on a local level is that we have European rules for short-term holiday rentals that um, uh, prohibits local authorities to step up against illegal um, uh, rentings. The expensive growth of short-term holiday rental in cities and popular tourist destinations is extracting housing from the market, driving up the prices and has a really negative impact on the livability of cities. And we want to give cities more control over rentals via platforms such as Airbnb and Booking.com and ensure that these platforms share information with the cities while respecting data protection rules. 
The Commission should tackle this in its proposal for the Digital Services Act. And um, uh, we also see that more and more member states are now, uh, including the Netherlands, are now trying to, um, to step up their game here and try to influence um, what the Commission will decide in this regard. Lastly, I think it's very important to mention that we have to combat housing discrimination. It is high time to ensure equal treatment for all and non-discrimination in the search for affordable housing. Housing is a basic right for everyone and the European Commission must enforce it by using infringement procedures against member states that are discriminating against population groups such as Roma. European standards and investment should contribute to accessible housing for people with disabilities. And in addition, the Commission must work to unblock the anti-discrimination directive that has been blocked in the European Council for 10 years. I want, would like to uh, once more express my gratitude to many of the people that are also part uh, of this, uh, this program today. Um, I think we have a very beautiful community that is all fighting to make sure that everyone can have a roof over their head. Um, I'm really counting also on your support in the way forward with the report towards the plenary vote. And um, I'm looking forward to hear if you have any questions and uh, to continue being in touch about this important topic. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Kim. There is one question that has come in. Um, um, first of all, we definitely are in line with you. This pandemic um, should not be an opportunity to uh, make the situation even more difficult for citizens, but the other way around, it should be an opportunity to really expand on um, the CLT cooperative models, the social housing, the public public housing, and all of those um, ways to bring down bring down the cost. So there's a question that came in. Um, how can, in your view, I mean, you touched on it a little bit uh, in your speech already. So how can uh, the CLT or collaborative collaborative housing fit into the provision of sufficient housing in the EU? And um, and then crucially, what are the next steps uh, following the report? That's a question that has come in from a local councillor from Leuven. Hmm. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. Um, so I think um, the CLT um, should, be, should be getting the opportunity that it deserves to be part of the plans from, from member states and from local authorities. You know, when we say we, we need to kickstart the economy by, by renovation and also by building more houses, we, we can't be too restrictive in, in what kind of housing projects this should be. And I think it's really important that we, we create the freedom to, to come up with these kind of initiatives. Um, I, I'm not so sure how much the EU can exactly do, but at least we are calling for, for this, uh, these opportunities to really be taken on board in the kind of plans and proposals that we are getting on an EU level. Um, and then what happens after the report has been adopted? Well, then we take the report, we go to the commission and say, okay, take action, please. We need action right now. We continue fighting for this um, in all the aspects in the European Parliament. Um, we know that the European Pillar of Social Rights Action Plan will come and um, we're definitely going to use that opportunity um, to try to uh, make sure that a lot of the proposals that have been endorsed by the European Parliament will be taken on board by the Commission. And um, we also have, as um, Greens EFA in, in the European Parliament started a campaign um, to already start campaigning towards the Commission on homelessness. Um, so if you also support the goal to eradicate homelessness by 2030, please go to our website and uh, support our petition. Great. Thanks a lot, Kim, for joining us. Thank um, you. We're happy to continue the support and, um, and good luck with that. Let's Thank stay you in so touch. much. Okay. Thanks a lot, Kim. Bye. Good. Have a nice Bye. weekend. <laughs> yes, great. We're going to now hear directly from um, three colleagues uh, working directly for the European institutions um, who are really also um, uh, going to, in fact, respond, maybe not respond directly to Kim, but in, in responding how in their fields they are also contributing to the work to, um, to provide Europeans with more affordable housing. Um, let me see if all the panelists are ready. This is always the way with these virtual events. We don't have people in the room, but maybe we can um, introduce uh, Thomas de Bethune is there, if I'm pronouncing yes. it correctly. Great. Thanks a lot for being there. Um, you're the team leader for urban policy at the European Commission. 
working on territorial cohesion, sustainable urban development, and EU funds, very crucially, very crucial topic at the moment, also mentioned by Kim, and uh, some a topic on many of our minds at the mo at currently in in Brussels. Uh, we also should have line on on have online Ocean um, Pfeiffer Smatia. Ocean, are you there? Yes. Great, uh, lovely to see you. Um, so for everybody to know, uh, Ocean is policy officer at the Director General for Internal Market, Industry, Entrepreneurship and SMEs, um, but from the Social Economy Unit, if I'm not mistaken. And um, your focus at the moment is on affordable housing, but in the context of the renovation wave and EU um, industrial clusters policy. So also something that was mentioned um, by Kim. And also in the financial sphere, we also, we also have a Brendan McDonough, Brandon, are you also LinkedIn? Yes, good, good afternoon yes. to all. Thanks a lot. Good to see you. I can hear you. And yes, uh, Brandon works for the EIB, the European Investment Bank, more specifically the European Investment Advisory Hub. And you're an advisor in that hub. Um, looking at, uh, previously you worked directly for the EIB itself on innovation and finance advisory division. So it's really great to have um, to get your perspectives on, obviously you can't speak for the whole of the EU, um, but really give your perspective on, on your sphere of work and how that fits into, today, into today's discussion. So how we arranged it as agreed was that you'd first give us a, an overview in around five, seven minutes of, of the relevance. And I think uh, we also have slides for each of you. So maybe we can already kick off with that. I think Thomas, uh, the bit, you know, we'll go, we'll kick us off on that. I yes. think you have just a couple of slides as well. So hearing about the urban dimension again. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry. Thank you, Sosha, for the introduction. And, and thank you to, uh, to Kim uh, just before, because I think that he, she, she did a good overview, and that's the advantage of the opinions of the parliament, that we have a, a, a large view of of the, the state of play for a specific issue like housing, which is complex. And I'm not the kind of person to believe that complex problems can be solved with simple solutions. And we can hear already also in her opinion that uh, many of the uh, EU policies have a link with the housing sector, obviously. Uh, a lot of regulation, that's clear. Uh, I'm working for the uh, uh, DG Regio for the cohesion policy. So cohesion policy is uh, not as such a regulatory DG in the commission, but more a funding DG, which provides money for regions with a uh, uh, a simple objective, which is to reduce um, to reduce disparities within Europe. Um, it's a, it's a big objective which exists already for 40 years, and uh, uh, we can see within Europe with this funding, and not only funding, with the method also of implementation, uh, reduced uh, disparities between regions. But it doesn't mean that uh, uh, the the job is done. There is still a lot of issues, and housing is one of them, and one important for the last. Uh, years we have seen uh, more and more local authorities uh, being empowered of development of housing issue and that's why I think there is a, a really interesting link that you are building on today uh, and I could hear from previous speakers that uh, uh, often it's cities that are on the forefront of this issue uh, socially uh, but also on the urban planning side uh, and when they have to uh, maintain and finance part of the housing uh, and in particular, the one which is the most important for uh, local authorities, which is the, the, the social and affordable housing, which is not the same thing. Um, let me start with, we, with what we, we provide today. Housing is not uh, uh, directly financed by uh, a cohesion policy, but we have uh, uh, some proxy, I would say, to finance it through renovation of housing and especially uh, 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 energy efficiency measures, and here has been mentioned a, a, a lot of initiatives that are to come with the Green Deal, the renovation wave, and so on. But also within the mainstream programs, regions, cities are implementing a lot of renovation in houses. And we have also what we are particularly cherishing, which is the uh, sustainable urban development approach. It's a way to delegate funds to cities for them to, to decide on the projects and their priorities. And, and this is a method of, uh, of funding and of uh, supporting cities at local level, which uh, combined with social funds 
uh, help at uh, developing integrated approach. And integrated approach is the way to uh, cross sector uh, um, the strategy, ensure that uh, we are not only touching on economic redeployment or innovation, but also include uh, uh, other issues that are of prime importance when developing cities. And uh, that's what we call the sustainable or development approach with a earmarking of funding for cities, which is just not only getting more money directly at city level, but it's a whole method of uh, also leaving them the possibility to select their projects. You know that uh, cohesion policy is not a policy that is uh, centrally managed. Uh, we are setting the frame, the priorities, the objectives, but it's really the regions and in this case, the cities themselves that are determining the priorities. At the, on the ground, there is more than, uh, today it's written 900, but 1,000 urban strategies that are actually implementing uh, 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 these, uh, these funds. During this programming period also, we have worked with Urbat, for some of, of, of you must know, which is a, a network of exchange of experience between cities in Europe, uh, nearly 100 networks, and uh, uh, many are touching upon the housing issue. Uh, experimentation also, we have a, a direct uh, uh, finance for cities to develop urban innovative actions, which are, uh, I would say, actions that have never been tested before, experimentation, to try to sort out uh, uh, complex issues with new solutions. And uh, in this case, we have also developed a call for, for housing and we have five projects within Europe. I, I advise you to go to see uh, and to look at this website if you want to look at innovative actions uh, in the housing sector. I'm sure many of you must know them or many of you have also applied for it because this program has, has a really huge success and, and we receive always much more projects than the ones we can finance. Um, if you might change slide, please. Um, for, the, for the future, actually, um, there is a, a, a certain continuity in the way we will fund. We are exactly at the transition period and that's where I would say uh, CLT might also play a role because uh, uh, when uh, we are in transition period, we are reconsidering priorities. And this is the case then for every regions and member states and cities in Europe who will receive uh, funds. They are redrafting their priorities. What are the frame we have set at EU level? We have a policy objective four, which is a, a social uh, uh, objective, the more social Europe based on the European pillar for social rights. Uh, for social rights. Um, and here with specific objective of integrated measures, which includes housing and social services. So there is a possibility and, and opportunities there to, to finance uh, housing development uh, um, in, in the frame of the cohesion policy with the European Social Fund. Uh, on the same time, you've got uh, the uh, ERDF, the European Regional and Development Funds, with the priority policy objective five, which is a priority objective close to Europe, closer to citizens, where we will continue with the sustainable urban development measures. On one side, you have one priority, which is more linked to the people, and the other one linked to the investment. And both together can be combined at local level by cities and regions to invest in housing. But let's be clear that this cannot be done uh, uh, just on individual project, that it needs to be embedded in a logic. I will come to that in a second with the, the key conditions that we see. Um, in the future, there will also be uh, technical assistance support, Urbac 4, the new program, a European urban initiative that we will actually launch uh, soon and that encompass the new innovative actions, plus a uh, platform for knowledge and exchange at EU level and with cities. You might maybe change the slide now. Yes, um, if I have to summarize, what are the specificities for housing investment within the cohesion uh, funds, within the, the structural funds, sorry. Um, we've got uh, some, uh, some uh, uh, key specificities to be looked at. And I think it, it's equal quite well with what I heard today in terms of uh, the way CLTs, but in general, social housing and, and uh, uh, affordable housing should be supported uh, uh, to be uh, really uh, um, targeting the right population, but also the right social effects. Um, the first one is that we need to have a good mapping of the housing needs and infrastructure at local level, which sounds uh, logical, but it's not always the case. And this needs to be uh, done closely involving the local communities. The second is to have an integrated approach. I already mentioned that. Um, it, should, it means that it should 
if we consider housing investment, it should complement uh, measures by in education, employment, social and healthcare uh, um, projects. It cannot be detached from it. The third one is the multi-governance approach. Here, obviously, local development uh, cannot be detached from uh, the national sectoral policies like education, employment, uh, um, and also larger investment in mobility, obviously. The third one, uh, the fourth one is the consultation and partnership with the target group concerns. Uh, this is the usual, but it is not so usual when you come at local level, uh, um, uh, participatory approach uh, to have the different sectors being present around the table. The um, fifth one is about the fact that uh, this investment should be uh, taken into account measures that prevent further segregation of communities. We have issued their uh, uh, guidance uh, to ensure that uh, there is no more um, uh, uh, spatial uh, segregation when creating the projects, for example, uh, by not creating individual uh, um, housing uh, constructions that are only dedicated to one population and not mixing with others. Uh, and the last one is about gentrification. Uh, 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 I would say a trend that we could really see. Yes, I will conclude. Uh, in, the, uh, in, in, in many cities when investment starts to flow, uh, by uh, ejecting part of the poorest population from the neighborhoods. And my last slide then would be not about the funding, but about the really important initiative of the Urban Agenda for the EU, which is not funded uh, through cohesion policy, but which is uh, an, an initiative to involve cities into the EU policy making and to take into consideration more the uh, problems of the cities in the EU. Um, we have 14 partnerships. We are now reconsidering the future by creating new partnerships, thematic. There is one on the housing, but many others are also uh, concerning, uh, uh, touching upon the housing issue. Uh, I could advise you just simply to look at there because 262 cities and governments worked on these uh, uh, partnerships to develop action plans that uh, present what needs to be done to improve the regulation, the knowledge and the financing of cities in Europe. And a large part of these actions are touching on the housing. I will finish just by saying that last Monday, there was a ministerial meeting of uh, ministers in charge of urban affairs in Leipzig. Uh, I mean, we call it Leipzig because we approved there the new Leipzig Charter. And the new Leipzig Charter is the new framework that member states agreed to follow for the urban development for the next decade. So um, housing is obviously really uh, targeted uh, and mentioned at number of uh, places in this document. Uh, I would really advise mm -hmm. you to look into this, uh, this document. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Thomas, for that um, overview. I know you had a really short time to put in a lot of information. And, um, and indeed, you, uh, something that does seem basic, so not basic evidence at local level, uh, and we would be surprised sometimes that is missing, and also evidence of now, but also forecasting of future needs. I'd just like to quickly come back with a very quick question before we, before we hear from Ossian, and um, that is, uh, because we are today talking about CLTs, where do you see that the CLTs and collaborative housing models fit in, in that vision that you've outlined from the Commission and the work that you're doing? Uh, but in, in, in the chain of, of the housing market, from the social to the uh, free market, CLT is part of the chain for the access for housing. And it's, in another, it's an innovative way of access to, uh, to housing and might be part of this, um, of this uh, funding uh, uh, possibilities that I just described. Uh, I would really advise uh, local authorities, uh, stakeholders on the ground, uh, partners to now uh, start to talk with their city uh, authorities with their region in charge of the funding to be sure that housing priorities and the type of housing that CLT can provide could fit into the programs. This is the way to be done. It's not at commission level that we decide what projects will be financed and what not. It is at local level, Indeed, regional so. level that this is discussed and I really, that's where it would be. On the yes, other side, it will also be in the, in the urban agenda for the EU, obviously, uh, uh, to be discussed in, in the hours. As well. So no, a number of pathways to follow. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you very much, Thomas. We're going to uh, hear from Ocean now. And as I mentioned at the start, Ocean's working for DG Grow, as we know it, for so responsible for internal market. And Ocean is going to give us an outline on her work linked to the renovation wave and the affordable yeah. housing initiative. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank Ocean. you. Thank you, Sophia. Um, okay, so I will start. Um, Okay, so indeed I work at DigiGrow and we've been uh, busy the past couple of months with uh, working with other colleagues and uh, other, I mean, stakeholders uh, to prepare this uh, renovation wave uh, that was um, uh, communicated on the 14th of October. And uh, I've been particularly involved in the uh, affordable housing initiative. Um, so next slide, please. Um, yes, so... Uh, very briefly, so the renovation wave, it's a new strategy for recovery. As uh, you may know, uh, one of the seven flagships of the uh, recovery package that was uh, presented by the commission is renovate. Uh, so renovating our buildings, it's, um, it's both, I would say, uh, uh, it, I don't, it has been identified as a, a strategy for recovery of the construction sector, but not only, all the sectors that are also um, related to, to renovation of, uh, of buildings. Um, it's also a way to making our Europe more resilient and uh, also a step to meet the target of the European Green Deal. Uh, as you know, 60% of the green greenhouse gases emissions come from buildings. Um, so the objective, the overall objective is by 2030 to have uh, to double the annual energy renovation rate. Um, and to, um, to allow the renovation of 35 million building units, creating 160,000 jobs in the construction sector. And this uh, renovation wave strategy has been designed according to seven key uh, principles that you can see in the, the market. And one of them is affordability. And it's, um, it's one uh, strong aspect of the renovation wave is to make it um, to, to have the uh, renovation possible for all, uh, benefit for all, and not to have a, a kind of phenomenon of renovation, what we call renovation, um, meaning that uh, renovation can have this rebound effect on the prices that can um, uh, impact, um, impact the, the possibility for tenants to stay in, in housing. Um, that's so there is one this focus also uh, in the renovation is to tackle energy poverty and to um, to feel I mean to invest in uh, in social and affordable housing as uh, Kim was saying uh, we have this uh, 57 billion investment gap in this sector um, and it's also uh, in this uh, line that we've been building um, the renovation way. So next slide, please. Um, okay, so. Um, Another key action, one key action of the renovation wave and is that uh, completely fits into the affordability principle is the affordable housing initiative. So the key objective of this initiative is to pilot the renovation of social and affordable housing districts. And what is foreseen is really to follow an integrated approach when it comes to renovation um, in a sense that uh, renovation of these house, housing districts should combine various aspects. It's not only about energy efficiency, but uh, about increasing the living conditions of the residents, uh, the accessibility, but also all the access to social and local services uh, that are available for, for at, a, at a neighborhood level. Um, another aspect that we really much want to to integrate and to, to use, to develop our human-centered business models. Um, this to promote social innovation, but also to find ways uh, to empower the residents into these renovation projects. So either using shared ownership or co-investment into the renovation project. Um, so the idea is really to innovate also or not innovate because we know it's already existing and um, it's, it's, it's very much relevant uh, to, to be speaking here as we really much uh, believe that CLT's models uh, can really inspire and pave the way uh, to, uh, to 
be able to fulfill the ambition that we have um, to have these human-centered business models to be promoted. Um, another point that I already touched upon is to ensure that the renovated units remain affordable um, in a sense that uh, for, for, for the housing units that are not uh, uh, considered uh, fully social housing and that are regulated, um, that these, the affordable uh, stock remains affordable. So this idea of cost neutrality of uh, the renovation. And in this sense, uh, we really much believe that uh, CLT's projects uh, can very much be uh, targeted uh, for this kind of renovation of the districts. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the expected outcomes of this initiative, it's not only about the renovation of, of 100 or more or less districts, it's really about demonstrating replicability potential towards other districts and setting up a network amongst social housing providers. But not only, we really much expect to support the, the establishment, the creation of local partnerships involving uh, different stakeholders that are um, uh, to be in, that are, I mean, involved in the renovation of such districts, uh, the construction sector, social housing providers, public authorities, but also um, reaching out to the civil society in general. Uh, there is also this aspect of skills that uh, we hope that the initiative will act as a catalyst um, and channel skills, um, new skills in terms of uh, uh, developing uh, human centers business models or socially promoting social innovation. Um, and as, as you may know, and you already know, and my colleague was, uh, was uh, already um, presenting them, there is a lot of funding opportunities for social housing uh, provision and renovation uh, through the EU funding. And this, this is going to be much uh, stressed under the renovation wave and also the renovation has a way for the recovery. But what we're really aiming at with this initiative is to support projects to go the extra mile in terms of environment, social, but a social ambition and also cultural ambition and innovative fun financing. Operating, I mean, to have all these aspects combined, we really much know that there's this need for this extra push. So about the next step, the first step is the creation of an EU level partnership. And we've been talking with the, the sector already uh, to create this partnership that is expected to be, um, to be set up early next year. Mm -hmm. Uh, gathering the, as I told you already, construction is, uh, sector um, in its general reach, I mean, reaching to renewable energy, creative industry, electronics, social housing sector, and we will much see CLTs as very relevant stakeholders to be associated here. Also the cultural uh, associations and all the, the creative um, uh, industries, and as well, of course, the local and regional authorities. Um, and what we expect in terms of a timeline is the start of the renovation project by the end of, uh, of uh, next year. Um, so that's it for now, but uh, we'd be very happy to answer any question. Yeah, um, first of all, I mean, what's um, interesting is the focus on the, the district level. Mm -hmm. um, what is the logic behind that, that focus indeed for the European Commission? Uh, sure. Well, I think first, um, Social, when it comes to social housing, since it is a focus here, um, they are very much often uh, built in blocks. And so per se, when we, we are specifically focusing on, on this uh, particular stock, uh, I think an approach at the level of a neighborhood, neighborhood is very relevant also because of the, all the local services that come along uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, social housing uh, units. Uh, but I think it's, it's more, it's also about that we believe that tackling digital and green transition for buildings, um, when it comes to innovating solu innovative solutions uh, or later state-of-the-art technologies, um, they, the, the ones that can bring long-term benefits um, are also operate, I mean, can be uh, are put in place at the district level. For example, district heating or the use of renewable uh, energy 
as a source of energy, as a source of heating. Um, these are um, new solutions that are, oper that, are, um, that are put in place, implemented at the district level. And simply also because there is this question of economies of scales. It's much more, it's much less costly to uh, renovate um, buildings together rather than going even unit by unit. I mean, when you do the heating system. So for a simple reason of economies of scales, and I think we also think, um, and it's maybe the, the most important point here is that uh, to be able to put in place and to work to combine the aspect of the participatory approaches and have human-centered business models, um, we need to operate at a community level. When we, we want to work with communities, um, they, I mean, this is a necessity to operate at this level. It is very much because we are uh, we have this ambition to develop this kind of models and to promote them through the, the initiative that we uh, we wanted really to appear at this uh, at this uh, level. And just okay. last but not least, this initiative is dem demand driven, and it was very much uh, because we've been discussing with the sector that, um, that it comes from the sector actually this uh, this, uh, this approach. And uh, it doesn't come as a surprise because the, the stakeholders that we are working with and uh, that will be uh, very much involved with the EU level partnerships that we are planning to launch are operating at this level. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think it can be a very useful tool if we are indeed to have a, a green and social deal and a green and social transition. But uh, yeah. I think it's um, very logical that we now move on to talk more about um, the financial uh, dimension here because um, so Tom, Thomas already outlined a little bit the, the structural funds that are available and, um, and we see that the renovation wave itself does not actually um, add any funds to the table. So what we, are, what we need to do is work with the existing funds and to allow them to achieve the goals of the renovation wave. So I think the European Investment Bank has a really key role to play here um, in the greening of Europe and specifically also the greening of the built environment and housing. So we're really happy that uh, Brendan McDonough could make it along today. And uh, he's working in one of the crucial parts so of, the, of the EAP, as I mentioned. So the advisory hub, because we all know that from local level, it can all seem extremely complex um, the, to access EU funds. Uh, so this um, intermediary or the handholding, as we heard earlier on, um, is really this, this this role is really crucial. So Brendan, please go ahead and give us an introduction. Uh, thank you, Sarka, and a pleasure to talk to you all. Um, in my few minutes, I'll assume everybody's comfortable understanding the EIB and its role. Maybe just talk about some specific housing projects and also to talk about our policy area in this context. So the next slide, when you have a, a moment, please. So the, the way we look at housing is across four different areas. Um, first of all, in terms of support for any area in the top left, you have a, the advisory hub where I work. That basically is a one-stop shop where you can come with your project proposal and look to get support and guidance in a first evaluation before it's submitted to a financial entity. Um, we do a lot of work with public bodies in that sense. Um, secondly, on the top right, you have an investment loan where you making the bank is making a direct loan to most often in housing public bodies um, in terms of housing associations or public institutions. On the bottom left, you have the direct framework loan. This is really where an entity, again, public body would come to us and say, we have a number of different developments we want to uh, propose and develop over a number of years. And we would work out a program with them whereby we would structure our finance over a few years um, to cover a number of projects. And sometimes though that number of projects can vary over two, three years. Um, the projects can come and go uh, for different reasons and we, we can allow some flexibility there. And the bottom right is an interesting model in the sense of it's a framework loan via an intermediary. And by that I mean the EIB is a large institution in one sense, but on the other hand we're very small in the banking world at a local level. And we only have the office in Luxembourg to deal with direct finance. 
and we have representative offices around Europe. So we don't have the local branch network and we use intermediaries in national promotion banks in particular, whereby we would put a framework uh, in place to support particular institute sectors. And then that uh, national promotion bank would then onward lend at the benefits of the EIB terms to that sector, be it housing, be it SMEs or uh, particular niche areas. So that's just to give you a quick flavor that we work in kind of four different areas. In terms of uh, some examples, I might get the, the next slide, please. Um, I thought it'd be useful just to give you a flavor that we're involved in different projects across Europe, um, be it in Scandinavia, um, where it's actually quite interesting that it's a private company that came to us looking to develop social housing um, and we're able to provide finance uh, to it. In Poland, we're working both on investment loan and with the in, in BGK. And in Warsaw, we're doing an individual loan with the public entity. Um, we've been involved in Germany in Stuttgart um, for its new build and renovations. Um, we've been involved in Ireland where we're talking to the housing finance agency. and They're providing that framework loan example to a number of different um, developments that they're looking at. In France, we have a few different uh, activities going on, um, both directly with um, new funding housing associations and also an intermediated loan, um, again, through a, a public institution, Action Logement. I'd leave the, the interesting piece, maybe particularly in the bottom in Spain, um, we're doing some ho social housing um, work in Barcelona, but also to the OCEAN just mentioned about social. We actually started something I think is quite innovative in Madrid with the municipality there, looking at social impact bonds to see how they could be used to help the homeless community. And basically a social impact bond is where the public um, sector entity determines that it will have a cost for a number of years, both in lost revenue um, in terms of, and also extra social contributions that they have to make. And they would then offer an incentive to a private entity to see could they offer some housing that would ultimately save that public sector some money whereby it reduced its costs. We have one um, up and running in, a couple up and running, but one in particular in Scandinavia is working with um, people who have recently come to the city, the country, and who are looking for a job. And the government there said, we think it will take us X number of years to get these people to the stage they can work. And they say that they will lose so much uh, in terms of spend on social welfare, and they will also forego the potential of those people being in the actual uh, work environment and lose the tax benefit. So they see a combination between those two costs, and they've said to a private developer, can you help us um, put these people in a situation where they can get to work much quicker? And as a result, um, they develop what's called a social impact bond. So that's just a, a complete model on a different sector. We're looking at it in Madrid to see if it's possible to do it. And we're at the feasibility stage, so it's much earlier. We're doing that in partnership with the Council of Europe Bank, um, or sorry, the, the Barcelona one is with the Council of Europe Bank. Um, I should say in terms of those funding models, we will fund up to 50%. We can't go above that. And we uh, will look to bring in partners and extra private or public money. We do not look to be the main provider of the finance. And we look to instigate finance activity, not to be the ones that are just providing the finance and crowd in others rather than crowding out other sources of finance. And maybe lastly, to go on to the third slide. Uh, I wanted to put this in, in a policy context that housing is really important for the bank for a number of reasons. One, there's a social dimension. Two, there's an investment gap there that's been clearly identified by Kim and referenced um, in the 57 billion. 
and three, in terms of we see it as important in the climate dimension too, that people are provided with that social benefit, but also the renovation and modernization of the existing housing stock is something we see as a big contributor to the climate agenda, and the bank is very keen to support that. We're there to be a first mover to take a step forward in areas that are quite niche, are quite uh, challenging for existing banks to fund. We try and um, be the ones that will crowd in and bring in other players into this wider market. And we only focus, I should say, on social and affordable housing. We are not involved in any sense in the private, uh, resident, private market um, for ordinary commercial activity. So I think that would conclude my overview of the, the sector and maybe, Sarke, if you want to mm -hmm. expand the discussion. Yeah, um, thanks a lot, um, Brendan. Yes, channel again, very short time, you manages to give a, an overview of what, of what you're doing uh, to assist in the delivery of, of affordable and social homes. Um, and obviously we see you're going to be very busy with the, with the, with the renovation wave as well, um, a big um, yes. role to play there. Um, then just going back to, to the, again to the topic of today, just from your perspective, um, what do you think, would you have recommendations to the community land trust model, the community um, led housing models from a financial perspective? Sure, I think from our point of view, I'd say two points. One, the bank, as I said, is a large funder of housing, but on the other hand, we can only deal with a limited number of projects and we look at scale and where we can make impact. So projects of 50 million and up, we would um, be able to consider as potential. Below that, we don't have the capacity and resources. And in that light, I think there's an important message for community land trusts to look at aggregating and pooling the resources. They, uh, if they can do that, they can do a number of things. One, they spread the risk for a financial institution. They're not looking at just one particular site and one area. They may be looking at multiple ones. And two, in terms of um, the bankability of a basic numerics, um, it will stack up much stronger. And you have a much stronger governance model um, with that aggregator of bringing those local individual sites together in one pool of activity. Indeed, it does make a lot of sense, yeah. Um, and I think we see a lot of, of that type of aggregation happening. You gave some examples today, so yeah, yeah. it's a good practical advice there. So we have and just nice. a couple more minutes um, just to check if we have some questions coming through. Yeah, there's one general question that comes through So for everybody that you can just um, have a think about. And it's in reference to minority populations and whether um, EU policies acknowledge um, minority populations and if this is considered in the approach to housing, is that something uh, maybe some of you want to come back on? And then one very one which I think we will redirect to to Toma. And this one indeed does come from. Um, from the Green Other Woman for Housing in Leuven, Lisa Cor Corneli. Um, I hope I got that right. Um, and she is wondering, um, how can Europe enable local authorities to execute their own local housing policies, considering that federal legislation is a big obstacle nowadays? Okay, it's a tricky one, as we know. Um, so we've already looked, discussed the competence issue, but maybe, Thomas, you want to address it? I mean, you already spoke about a couple of the programmes, but maybe... No, I, I, I think from, from, from the person from Leuven, I, I, I think mm -hmm. it's Lisa Corneli, if I heard well. Um, yes. I, I didn't spoke about, or maybe it was the wrong word, then housing policy at national level, that local level should, uh, should uh, have their own housing policy. This is really different in every member state, in fact, and in even sometimes in every region, especially, for example, Leuven is a Flemish region which has its own housing uh, policy uh, um, competence. So uh, what I meant is the housing investments are at local level and they have to determine that often uh, member states and some cities are owner of a big stock uh, of the houses and uh, have to decide on the day to day how to transform it and keep them uh, sustainable financially, environmentally, and socially. 
So this is what I meant by this uh, intervention. Now on this marginalized group, I just want to refer to the specific objective of the policy objective four that you can find for the future of the cohesion policy, which says that the objective is to increase the socioeconomic integration of marginalized, marginalized communities, migrants and disadvantaged groups through integrated measures, including housing and social services. This is the text uh, I think of the regulation, if I'm not mistaken. So I think it's clear there is a focus. Thank you, Thomas. And maybe some final words from Ocean or for, from Brendan on, on, on both of those questions, in a way. Both sort of quite tricky ones. Ocean, you want to yes. comment? Um, so, the, but the question on the minorities, um, um, yes, I didn't have uh, really much thought about it, but indeed when we, we have been designing the affordable housing initiative, there is this, um, this aspect uh, of uh, access to local services and I mean the community sense and how we can really much uh, promote um, borders that are taking into account integrating the residents needs and I think this is part of it I mean um, that some renovate that renovation is an opportunity uh, to really tackle um, other aspects than just energy efficiency to tackle um, how to really improve the living conditions, including the living condition of minorities that uh, indeed uh, live uh, very often in, in uh, social housing uh, districts. Indeed, in, in a holistic way. And Brenda, maybe the final words from you to wrap up the panel. I mean, in a way, you're the advisory hub is also indirectly supporting local authorities, of course, on their, in their um, housing missions. Yes, uh, the, the role of the advisory hub, as I said, was to set up by the Commission and the Bank as a joint initiative, recognising that project promoters put a plan together, but they basically need to work with somebody before they could submit it to a financial institution. I always describe it like you make your own application for your first loan and you give it probably to a friend or a parent to read over it. In the same way, we would look over an application and provide guidance and input and say, this is where you can strengthen it. This is where you need to further develop your, your proposal before you get to submit it. And uh, I think housing is really important and the bank is very focused on it. As I said, we have the challenge around, we need projects of scale, um, but environmentally climate and energy. And I think the renovation aspect will become really, really important going forward as well as new build. Very balanced approach. Thank you very much to all of you. Um, I think um, they're all conversations that we're going to be continuing over the next weeks and months. Um, and that has been really, really useful. And um, now we are, and also thank you for keeping the time because we're really on perfect uh, timing uh, to welcome Michael Lafon, hope I'm saying it correctly, uh, to talk crucially, a really crucial question. I hope you, were, last time I checked, we were still 130 people here on, online joining in the discussion. So, um, so, so let's hang in there. And um, it's a crucial question of the next steps for the European uh, CLT movement. And that's what you're going to talk to us a little bit about. And just so all of you know, uh, Michael uh, Lafon, he's a common good community developer, um, a co-housing expert and urban activist, and crucially, of course, chair of the uh, Berlin Community Land Trust. And again, it's not called CLT there, it's called a Stadt Bodenstiftung. Um, and you're a member of the advisory board. And um, so we're really looking forward to hearing the perspective from Berlin on the, on the, the next steps. All right, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I assume you can hear me? Yes, that's perfect. We can hear um, you. It's actually Michael Lafon. Oh, I see, yes, I was pronouncing it. But that's okay, I understand. And uh, once again, hello to everybody out there, the 130 people or so that I can't see. Um, it's an honor to be uh, giving this final summary of the Sikh movement. And it's also a bit of a challenge after a few hours of a lot of information and amazing stories and uh, questions and discussions 
So I'll do my best to give you a, a concise summary of what seems to be the, the highlights of the uh, Sikh movement in Europe these days. Um, it's been noted earlier this evening, I think by Kiat from Brussels, that uh, the urban CLTs, um, will I be able to control the presentation? I can't seem to move it. Maybe this somebody else otherwise. could move it. I'm sure somebody, if somebody else could, could move it to the next slide. Yeah, thank yeah, you. you um, yeah, so as you can see, we've got these emerging community land trusts um, all over Europe. Most of them out there in the Northwest, France, England, but also bringing in Scotland, Wales, Ireland, uh, the Netherlands, Belgium. And as you can see the little red dot way out there in the East, out there in Central Northern Europe is where we are in Berlin. Uh, so thanks for inviting us to be part of this uh, SHIC network. Um, we're one of the, the new initiatives in the project. Um, if things keep, things keep going the way they are, uh, as you can see with the numbers on the screen, we could or should be up to about 500 urban community land trusts in the next years. And this means that we'll be in a position to be developing quite a few thousand uh, new affordable homes, uh, housing quite a few tens of thousands of people. Um, can we go to the next slide? So what are some of the achievements or some of the highlights of the SHIC project if we look back over the last three or four years? The work has been basically built around six areas. Uh, first of all, number one, strengthening the four pilot projects. So as has been said this evening, the, uh, the initiating projects coming out of Brussels, Lille, London, and Ghent. So over the last few years, they've had the support, the resources, the information, and funding to get themselves established and to be up uh, and, and running quite well. Uh, number two, the implementation of what's called the Transnational Startup Fund. So this has meant uh, paying for supporting expertise, which can be legal, financial, uh, to uh, 30 or 40 emerging CLTs around Northwestern Europe uh, and coming all the way out to Berlin and Germany now. Uh, this includes a network of somewhere more than 100 technical advisors. Number three, this means improving the financial environment for the CLTs. So for the last years, this has really meant as part of a diagnostic phase, really understanding the financial world. So what are the potential funding sources for the community land trust at the local level? regional, national, or even at the European level. An operational phase uh, will be coming up uh, in the next months, and we'll be getting back to that later. Number four, capacity building activities. Quite a number of peer-to-peer -peer events have been organized, bringing together hundreds of people, and three transnational conferences have been organized in different countries over the last years. Quite a bit has been done in terms of communication. We've heard about campaigning in London this evening, but in addition to that, promoting uh, case study research, the documentation of the emerging projects, sending out the quarterly newsletter to hundreds and thousands of people to create really the public uh, and to, uh, to drive this, this uh, young movement. And number six on this list, um, trying to understand the long-term effects of these projects. So creating what's called a social impact framework to understand how community land trusts uh, can and do relate to the local neighborhoods and cities, socially or perhaps ecologically speaking, as we've been talking about this evening. And a number of things have been taken on over the last months and years, uh, advocacy campaigns, uh, getting letters of support from the mayors of the larger cities involved, supporting policy papers, and finally getting recognition of the CLT model 
in uh, housing at the European level. It's important to note that all of these resources can be found uh, on the SHIC website connected to the uh, European Union. So going on to the next slide, um, the SHIC network, uh, the SHIC project is happy to have a number of success stories over the last few years. And one of them is uh, the success of being recognized as the winner of this Regio Stars Award uh, in the category of citizens engagement for uh, <clears throat> cohesive cities. So once again, the SHIC program is uh, focusing on inclusive and cohesive cities. The competition, which is organized by the European Commission, aims to reward projects that are considered to be relevant and innovative. And through this award, the CLTs have once again gotten the, the attention of the European Commission, which is quite good for the movement. So going on to the next slide, uh, we're talking about the European Union CLT Guide, a significant publication which is really summarizing these last few uh, years of uh, movement building called the Urban Community Land Trust in Europe towards a transnational movement. So what's in this guide, it's got an overview of the recent history of the CLT, so that means the last three or four years, and the development, especially in the larger Northwest European cities. It's focusing on success stories, but it's also talking about the challenges that are still facing all of us. Um, it's discussing how this CLT model is emerging, uh, but not just in Northwestern Europe, and uh, us over here in Berlin are happy to be included in the Northwest uh, region, which apparently has been expanded to include us uh, for the next phase. But the publication is also looking at the emergence of community land trust kinds of initiatives going into central southern and Eastern European cities. So, so we see that we're dealing with what is really well on its way to becoming a European movement. These work resources, of course, uh, are also found online. Just to note, the publication uh, is available, uh, not in all European languages, but at least in four, uh, dealing with English, French, Flemish, and German. And uh, as was noted earlier this evening, Another great resource for people interested in the community land trust movement, not just in Northwestern Europe, but looking around uh, the rest of the world, is this fantastic publication called On Common Ground, uh, a review of the movement uh, really internationally. So I can recommend you look for a place to order your own copy of that. Going on to the next slide. The next steps for the SHIC project. Um, first of all, so we're moving into the next year, the SHIC 2.0 phase, which uh, will see the expansion of the European network, not just the original four cities, but including uh, the people in Amsterdam, us in Berlin, uh, which as was noted this evening, uh, will be based on the CLT model or is based on the CLT model as we know it, but which has a German word, the Stadtboden Stiftung, uh, supported by my organization, which is ID22. The work in Amsterdam is supported by the organization called And the People. Uh, in Scotland, you've got the Mid Steeple Quarter project supported by Dumfries and Galloway Small Community Housing Trust. And over in Ireland, uh, the support of uh, the CLT movement there, supported by self-organized architecture in Dublin. Um, also going into the next year, uh, doing much more exchange and mutual learning. So again, this means uh, strengthening the network that's already there, further events and actions, of course, a lot of stuff online including webinars and uh, Zoom conferences, but hopefully also some meetings face-to-face, -face, for example, another large transnational conference uh, in June of 2021. 
importantly, we'll be setting up an informal CLT network to uh, take in as much of Europe as possible. Of course, there's a lot of advocacy work that still needs to be done at the local, national, and the European levels. Um, at the local levels, uh, of course, working with our own local governments to uh, convince them that this is a good thing. At the national level, looking for uh, legislation that can recognize the community land trust models in the respective countries. And at the European level, as we've been hearing quite a bit about this evening, looking for support either directly or indirectly. Um, this means also ambitiously moving forward to set up what's called a transnational investment platform. So as we've been hearing from in the last uh, minutes and hours, uh, we're quite optimistic that we'll, there will be some more support coming our way, uh, either through this uh, wave of renovation or through the Green New Deal or the Social New Deal, as we like to think about it. Uh, so there, is, there are studies and, of course, discussions going on as to how this can be made concrete. Finally, moving on to the next slide. Um, Summarizing all of this, more exchange, more advocacy, technical assistance for the emerging CLTs, um, as has been suggested, um, we're looking for ways to combine various initi initiatives to bundle the projects in terms of uh, looking for support, looking for funding, uh, basically pulling resources together. Um, how can we scale up what we're doing at the local level with our local communities uh, in the sense of being in the most positive way, collective and cooperative of moving our uh, various local community land trust projects forward. So this brings me, I think, to the conclusion of my summary. I uh, thank you for your attention and um, yeah, pass it on back to Sorka. Thanks, everybody. Thanks a lot, Michael. I think your last slide there is a pretty uh, long to-do list for, for everybody involved. So plenty to do in the, in the next steps uh, to follow up on all of those action areas. <clears throat> yes, uh, as you said, we've come really to the, to the end of the session, not the end of our work, but uh, the end of today's session and the end of the, of the working week as well. And it just left over to me to give you a sort of short conclusion, short sum up to, to what we've um, gone through this afternoon. Um, I think the project we can really see has been a real success. And as at Housing Europe, we were happy to be in there from um, the start of the project as, um, as advisory um, sort of supporting partners. Um, and we can see that um, since 2010, their number of CLTs has gone up from 30 to 170. So you can see that it's a growing movement. You can be proud to be part of that movement. And I think what we saw today, that is thanks to a lot of different factors. So very much, I think we've all been very much impressed by the, the um, Costa and Razia giving us that perspective um, of the importance of those activists and campaigners on the ground and how they found that it gave them also, it drove them in their own uh, personal conviction, but also is, is supporting their communities. Um, we, also, we also heard about how important it is to have that buy-in from the public authorities and partnerships with the public authorities. And we heard from quite a few of those today, from, from, um, from Britain, from France, from Netherlands. So obviously only a few, we, don't have, we didn't have all of them. Um, and, um, and many different um, other partners. And I think that was also a message that came through, the importance of partnership working, and of course, um, partnership with um, the um, social, public, uh, cooperative housing providers, of course, that, who we work with uh, directly here as well in, in Housing Europe. Um, I think what um, is very clear is that uh, more and more people are convinced that, that CLT is an interesting model, a viable model, and one which uh, definitely has a role to play in this bigger puzzle of, of what is the, the, the housing crisis. 
And uh, we also saw when we talked about ecology and circular economy and renovation way that, um, of course, the role of uh, responsible housing into those uh, broader EU goals is, is really crucial. And I think it's increasingly, there's an awareness of that. And we heard from some of those EU officials um, on that as well. And I think um, what's really a, a good, really important point to take away is that we're at a crucial point in history. And I think Kim really brought that home. And um, there's a risk that this pandemic can be an opportunity for the wrong reason. So um, more investment for very short term uh, profit going into the real estate sector as other sectors become less interesting, such as um, the commercial or airline. And so we have to make sure it's not an opportunity to concentrate ownership in, um, among profit-making, short-term profit-making stakeholders um, and speculators, but that this really turns into an opportunity for citizens to have um, affordable housing in the long term. So this can really be an opportunity to address the, um, the systemic housing crisis. Um, I just refer you quickly to the, the, the Schick uh, policy paper, looking at better knowledge around what the CLT uh, model can do. And I think it's, um, it's important to have this, um, this explanation also at many different levels at EU level. I know it is also being included at, at UN level via the Housing 2030 model, working at the UN ECE, UN Habitat Initiative, together with Housing Europe, looking at um, gathering those useful tools for policymakers, and the CLT model has also been included there in the Housing 2030 um, initiative. Looking at better regulation, so better, a, a more um, um, facilitary regulatory environment for CLTs to operate, and of course better finance. And I think that's been, uh, we've covered that quite a little bit today with the French perspective, with the European perspective. Um, so the, obviously, and the, the respect perspective from, from the UK, obviously the financial aspect is really crucial. So just to sum up, thank you all for still being there. It's quite incredible. Um, I think the team um, um, who've asked me to do this, so Joaquin, Diane, uh, Stephanie, Colin, they've all been behind the scenes working a lot in uh, making sure this session ran smoothly today. And um, and yes, they've asked me also to inform you that um, the, the project goes on until, as we know, spring 2021. There, you can receive their webinar um, and their newsletters um, right until the final conference um, next year. And this link, so this link, this webinar was recorded, so it's going to be shared as well. Um, so let's continue the, the good work in, for a rights-based approach to housing. Very happy to have been involved today and I've learned a lot and feel really inspired. So um, I'll see you all at various points in the future and um, have a great weekend. So thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for joining. Bye now.